So I am Ann Schuster. I am the education specialist for the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board. My background is in habitat restoration, mostly around Western Washington, but also Eastern Washington uh, when I was doing some wetland stuff with the Department of Transportation. I got my undergraduate from the Evergreen State College in ecology and scientific illustration. So all these plant drawings are mine. I did my master's of conservation science from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. So today I'm gonna first go through noxious weed law in Washington briefly, and then I'm gonna go into the updates to the weed list and weed law that happened just earlier this month, because it's still November. So the Washington weed law, as we have now, was basically started in 1975 to protect Washington's economy, agriculture, natural resources, and also human health from noxious weeds, just because some noxious weeds, as Sky will get into, are dangerous, like things that are toxic or things that are pokey. So this weed law has been in place for quite a few decades, but the original weed law in Washington state started, I believe, in 1905. It was before Washington wasn't even a state. And I think it might have been one of the first weed laws in the U.S. And it was just to consider Canada thistle as a noxious weed and to stop Canada thistle. Didn't work that well. Canada thistles everywhere, but it kind of opened the door to what we have now. There are two main sections to the weed law that we have today. The first one is the one that us at the weed board administer, and that's the weed list, the schedule of penalties, um, basically everything that has to do with noxious weeds and controlling them, who has to do it and when. The other part of the weed law is the prohibited plants list, also known as the quarantine list. And that one is administered by the Washington Department of Agriculture. So they work in tandem and a lot of the time, and they just sort of handle different parts of the, of the law. So the quarantine list is what regulates what can and can't be sold in Washington weed-wise. For the noxious weed list, not for the quarantine list, we rely on proposals from the public to update and change the weed law. So starting at the beginning of next year, January 1st, until April 30th is when we take submission from the public for changes to the weed list. This can be uh, new plants to be listed, plants that aren't already on the list. Also, it can be plants that can be uplisted to a higher priority list or downlisted to a lower priority list. At this point is also when we can completely delist species. We can only list species that are non-native to Washington, so I've gotten a few requests to list uh, stinging nettle, but we can't do that because it is a native plant. We also can only do plants. I've gotten requests before for algae, which is not actually a plant. So we get those until April, and then starting in May until September is when the Noxious Weed Committee, which is appointed by the board, reviews those changes, does research, and eventually makes final recommendations to the board in September. And then the board looks at those recommendations until early November when they have a public hearing. And then the day after that hearing is when the board takes all of that information into consideration and makes their final vote on what changes and what doesn't change for the noxious weed law. Then January is when those that noxious weed law takes effect. After January is when the each county has 90 days to update their local county weed list. So they get the weed list, then they have to list on their local county weed list all class A's that were listed to the state list, they also have to list class Bs that were designated in their area or in part of their area of their county. So it could be a specific lake, for instance, or a specific lake is not part of the designation for that plant. Then they can take pretty much any other plant that they want to put on their list and put that on their list as well. So counties might take class Cs for that. They might take plants that aren't listed on the list at all. I believe some counties might even have some native plants on that list if the native plants are particularly problematic in their area. And a lot of times those selected species in that final group that they choose to select are usually more for education than uh, regulatory 
need of control. So this is oriental clematis. It is an example of a class A weed. And these class A weeds are the highest priority species and oriental clematis is just one example of them. Uh, and all these photos are from Sue Bird, who we'll be presenting later today. And a lot of these class A weeds are a lot rarer in Washington or may not even occur in Washington at all. And that is because we're really stop trying to stop them from taking over at all or getting a foothold at all. They might just be present in one place in Idaho. Or in the case of oriental clematis, there's uh, just some infestation in Yakima County and not anywhere else in the state. And we want to keep it that way. So Yakima County is working really hard now with drones, actually, which is really awesome, to control this oriental clematis and stop it from getting into other counties. Uh, other examples of class A's are like, I believe Russian thistle is kind of a recent one. And that's, I don't know if there's any sightings of it in Washington recently, but it is present in Idaho and we don't want it to get here. So for these class A's, they are required for eradication statewide within one calendar year of being listed. That means all plant parts have to be killed. Uh, oftentimes they can be then destroyed or thrown out, um, burned, but they have to at least be dead. And so for large infestations like oriental clematis, Yakima County is working on that and they're gonna get there eventually. And for other things, it means hand pulling a plant and that is it. And so all plant parts have to be completely killed. That means anything that can reproduce and also any part that can't reproduce. We also petition for all of these plants to be added to the quarantine list to WSDA, and they take our recommendations very seriously. And so they tend to then not allow these plants to be sold. The next classification down are class B weeds. And these weeds are usually common in some parts of the state, but not common in other parts of the state. So an example of one of these would be scotch broom, where it is very common in the western side of the state and not at all common in the eastern side of the state. So in the eastern side of the state, it is designated for control. And that means it is still economically feasible to control scotch broom in one calendar year in most places on the eastern side of the state, whereas it is not economically feasible in one year to control scotch broom in most places in the western side of the state. So pretty much anywhere on the eastern side of the state, if they find scotch broom, they have to control it within one calendar year. And control is different from eradicate. Control means any reproductive part has to be killed and destroyed so that it can't successfully reproduce. So for something like scotch broom, that would mean mowing is counts as control. It doesn't kill the plant, but scotch broom can only reproduce by seed. For something like knotweed, that would mean killing the whole plant because knotweed can reproduce from, say, any plant part. And it's not always half and half uh, down the middle of the state, these designations. Sometimes it'll be designated everywhere in the state except for one lake in King County, that type of thing. The next classification down of weeds are class C weeds. These are really common weeds. They're really widespread. Sometimes they're easier to control. Other times there's just really no hope to control them in one calendar year and people work on them as they can, as they have resources to. An example of these would be Canada thistle, like the, from the 1905 law. It is everywhere in Washington and in pretty high quantities. Uh, some counties may select these for control, uh, but a lot of them just do education on them instead. The next list down is not a regulatory list at all. This is the monitor list. And these are a list of plants that we just want more information on. We don't really know their spread in Washington. We don't know their impacts in Washington. And so we just want more information to potentially list them in the future. So each one of these plants on this list have a sponsor. And so, for example, it's a stinking iris. These pictures are of. And right now, I believe San Juan County is concerned that it could be a problem in the future. And so they're just monitoring it. And we take reports from anywhere around the state and they go to the sponsor who is San Juan County. And then every few years, the weed board will ask all of the 
counties and all the sponsors for all the reports on their monitor list species and then consider what should be listed, what shouldn't be listed, what we want to gather more information on for maybe another, say, decade. Or what do we think it's been on the monitor list for so long and it hasn't spread and it probably won't ever spread, so we're going to take it off the monitor list completely. So these are ones that don't have any regulatory requirement for control. The last list of plants that we deal with is the quarantine list, also known as the prohibited plants list. And this is the one that's administered by the Department of Agriculture, not by the Weed Control Board. And these are plants that are not allowed to be sold in Washington, sold within Washington, sold out of Washington. Um, absolutely no sale of these plants at all. A lot of these plants are on the noxious weed list. Um, they tend to take any recommendation that we make, including all class A's, they will take recommendation to put on this list. They take a few B's, a few C's, um, not always. They can take proposals from the public to add to this list, just like we do with the state weed list, but they prefer these proposals to come from a more official entity, an environmental nonprofit, an agency, that sort of thing, so that they know there's more research and thought going into that proposal. Uh, some of these plants that aren't on the noxious weed list tend to be plants that might be problems in certain, uh, like, um, economies or certain groups. So, for instance, water chestnut might be more of a problem in uh, aquariums than in the wild in Washington. And actually, I see those big Batman symbol like seed pods for sale as parts of jewelry. Um, and they're not technically allowed to sell even the seed pods as jewelry. So these are some resources on how to identify noxious weeds in your area, maybe how to get assistance to control noxious weeds in your area. Us at the Weed Board, we have a lot of publications. We'll hopefully have seed packets in the next few months to give out for some native seeds. We have lots of information. If you email us, I'll do my best to identify the weed for you. Uh, your local county weed board, your local conservation district, and your local WSU extension office are also really great resources to help you identify plants and also to get assistance, perhaps even on the ground controlling them, depending on the resources that your area has. They may be able to come out and identify the plant for you in person, um, make a plan with you to help manage your property, that sort of thing. The Washington Invasive Species Council, which Maria will talk about more later, they have lots of information on other species that are invasive that aren't just plants. They cover some plants, but they also cover things like spotted lanternfly or feral hogs. For plant identification, if you want to try and go it on your own and not reach out for assistance with a photo and an email, I really like the Berkerbarium for plant identification. Um, they're really great. They have just, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of species that have been found in Washington there. I've played around a little bit with some AI and I don't like it very much, but other people find it as a good jumping off point. It's a lot better on flowers, sometimes on leaves. It's not very good on grasses. So I don't recommend using an AI app to try and identify a grass. So with the remainder of my time before Sky Talks, I'm going to go through these three noxious weed list changes. Um, one other thing in addition to these species additions, we did have a small rule update to the noxious weed list where board members have to recuse themselves from votes on noxious weeds that they produce or have other economic interest in. Um, one of our board members was or is a holly grower and in future holly gro votes should holly ever come up for listing again he would not be allowed to vote that sort of thing so i'm going to start with palmer amaranth as far as the new species this year this is a class a that means it's required for control i mean eradication not just control anywhere in the state as soon as it's found pretty much it's a summer annual it's all it's herbaceous but kind of thick and big. It reproduces only by seed, but it can make, I've heard up to half a million seeds per plant. 
Those seeds can be viable in the soil for up to five years. They are native to North America, but not this far north in North America. So they do count as a invasive species and non-native species for Washington. To identify Palmer amaranth, um, it's most important to be able to tell it apart from other amaranths that can look pretty similar. So Palmer amaranth, Palmer amaranth are big. They can get six to eight feet tall, up to 10 feet tall. They grow really fast, especially in exactly the right conditions. They can grow two inches a day. The leaves are egg-shaped to oval. And the most important thing to note about them from other amaranths is that they have a very small spine at the very tip. And also the petiole, also known as the stalk or the stem on of the leaf that attaches the leaf to the main stem or stalk of the plant, that is longer than the leaf. So you can see in that top corner picture, that immediate leaf stem is longer than the leaf. And that's another way to tell it apart from other species of amaranth. The branches are waxy and very smooth. They're not hairy. Lots of other amaranths are really hairy. So another thing is that amaranths are dioecious. That means each plant is either male or female rather than a lot of plants uh, have flowers that are male and female. So the male plants, that flowering spike is really soft. And if it's opened kind of recently, it has a lot of pollen that spreads on the wind. The female plants, on the other hand, are really prickly. Uh, you can see those flowers on that picture immediately next to the text. Those weird looking spiky burrs, those are actually the female flowers. Those are not seeds. You can tell they're not a showy flower, like when you think of a flower. They're spiky bracts that are a little bit funny looking. They look kind of like a gall. So the female flowering spike is made up of a lot of those and they're stiff and spike and prickly, spiny. So in, I believe, June, there were no known Palmer amaranth in Washington. As of August, there were two separate infestations known in Washington. They came in really quickly. Um, they established really quickly. They are now controlled, but we want to keep them that way. We don't want more. These plants are, they, they, they pose a serious impact to agriculture in Washington. Uh, this was kind of an emergency listing uh, because of how damaging they can be to agriculture. Uh, since they weren't even known to be in Washington or known to be nearby to Washington until August. So we just kind of rushed this through with the rest of the listing this year. And those two infestations are known, or were known, they're now dead, to be near Spokane and near Tri-Cities. So they like open areas, they like sunny areas, they like disturbed sites. Um, they would definitely do better in eastern Washington than in western Washington. They are very drought tolerant, so they like the dry. They really aggressively invade crop fields and they can lead to very massive yield losses for those farmers. A lot of states won't allow any produce, grains, that sort of thing from being even allowed into their state if it has any Palmer amaranth seeds present. So this is something we really wanna make sure that doesn't get uh, really into Washington's agriculture. It, they especially like to invade annual crops. Also, they can be toxic to livestock uh, depending on how many alkaloids they have. So to control Palmer amaranth, prevention is absolutely the best method. It is very difficult to control Palmer amaranth with chemicals because they are resistant to a lot of herbicides. So Maria will go through more about prevention of noxious weeds spread in her talk later, but pretty much clean any vehicles, equipment, uh, tires, footwear, if you think there might be palmer amaranth so seeds in the soil. You can hand pull or dig out small infestations. A large infestation won't be controlled by mowing because they'll just set seed closer. You can do prescribed fire on them, that probably won't work in an agricultural setting very well. Uh, just can be dangerous in a lot of resources. And if you want to use herbicides on them, every time you use an herbicide, the next one you use 
rotate and change the method of action that your herbicide has. Um, I know that the ones in Washington have genetics that indicate they are resistant to glyphosate and at least two other herbicides. So you could use glyphosate, but then the next time use maybe a different type of herbicide. The next plant that we added to the noxious weed list or changed on the noxious weed list was variable leaf water milfoil and their hybrids. So variable leaf water milfoil was on the list for at least the last 10 plus years. But this year we added hybrids, their hybrids to the weed list because we found that there were hybrids of this plant uh, in lakes in Western Washington that had hybridized with actually our native water milfoil. And these are entirely aquatic plants with a small stem sticking out the very top of the water during certain parts of the year. They look like vines in the water. Uh, they reproduce really well vegetatively. They just kind of break off and spread everywhere. They can reproduce by seed, but not very much. The hybrids are difficult to identify without genetic analysis, but if they look like the variable leaf water milfoil, that's easy to tell apart from our native one because the variable leaf water milfoil, the leaves vary. On the above the water surface, the leaves are entire. They aren't broken up. They're not frilly. They are whole leaves. Whereas the leaves below the water are really frilly. Like you can see in that picture, they almost look like algae. They look, look like feathers. They're really small, uh, thin and delicate almost. The flowers are really not showy at all, as with most aquatic plants, so don't be on the lookout for flowers. It's They are known to be in a few lakes around western Washington. They probably wouldn't do very well in most places in eastern Washington. Perhaps larger lakes or rivers that are don't maybe freeze over entirely or get very, very cold just because of their size. Those would be the places I would look for them in eastern Washington, but pretty much any slow-moving or stopped body of water in western Washington, they can get in. They really impact anything native or living at all in the lake or river or pond that they're in. They will grow really fast, they'll die off, they'll kill the fish that live there, they'll smell terrible, and then they'll regrow the next year. They also get caught up on boat rudders, so if you recreate on a lake that has milfoil, it really can slow you down. It can mess up your boat. To control these plants, if you have a small population, you can pull them. Uh, if you can get in the water, you can dig them out. You can use a benthic barrier, especially maybe on a smaller pond, because they need to be on some sort of soil substrate at the bottom of the lake or the pond. If you want to use herbicide on these, you have to make sure that you have the right permits and the right herbicides for aquatic use. So you'll need to contact the Department of Ecology and the Washington State Department of Agriculture to make sure that you have the right training, the right specifics, um, the right permits in order to use the correct herbicide that has been labeled for aquatic use. And you'll want to follow those label directions very closely. With all of these plants that I talk about whenever I talk about herbicide, you always have to follow the label directions. You always have to know your local regulations and your local laws. You always have to wear PPE, but this is especially important for aquatic plants and, aqu and areas near aquatic areas and aquatic areas in and of themselves. But once you get those right permits, um, the herbicides that you'll probably be allowed to use will be labeled for aquatic use, and there'll be maybe a 2,4-D, endothal, triclopyr, diquat. Um, those are all some options that have some labeling for aquatic use if you can get the right permits. The last plants I'm going to go over today are European, American, and their hybrid beach grasses. These were added as class C, so they are not required for control anywhere in the state. We wanted to give people uh, flexibility, I guess, to control or not control these plants if they want to or need to. Some places rely on these beach grasses to hold sand for infrastructure protection. Other places need to remove these beach grasses and need funding to help remove these beach grasses because they are absolutely pushing out all native plants. So these are plants, these are grasses that are 
very extensive in the root system. They also spread by just clumps of the roots floating off when the during like wave action in the winter when they will just break up and float off. Grasses are hard to identify. I'm not going to go into this too much. Just know that the hybrids of these plants can look like one or both of their parents. Um, and pretty much any grass that you see on a dune on the coast of Washington is one of these grasses. We don't have very many native grasses that live on the dunes in Washington. Um, and these ones have pushed out basically everything native on those dunes. So if you go out to the coast of Washington and you see grass, it's one of these. They are really impactful in that they push out basically all native plants, all native species. They form huge dunes that wouldn't normally be there. So there's lots of birds and insects that aren't adapted to these dune habitats that are now dominating the entire outer coast of Washington. Uh, we They were planted really extensively in the early 1900s with the European beach grass more north, the American beach grass more south, and they have hybridized here in Washington, and those hybrids are starting to kind of spread out to Oregon and British Columbia from here. They hold on to sand really well, so that's why they were planted on purpose. Um, the I believe the city of Long Beach, for instance, relies on these grasses to hold on to the sand dunes so they don't have to blow sand off of their roads every single day. On the other hand, now they don't have any of the native dune species that they normally would have. So for instance, the state parks um, in Washington are using um, these grasses to protect some of their infrastructure at their state parks, but they're also killing this beach grass at other places where they want habitat increases. So that's just an example of the dichotomy for this plant. To control it, you'll want to do ongoing pulling or digging for at least two years if you want to do a mechanical control, perhaps for a smaller infestation. Controlled burns are really, really effective, but they're very difficult to have the trained manpower to do. Um, also on the beach, it's difficult to get water resources for a controlled burn. For chemical control, they respond very well to glyphosate and amazapyr, especially from September to February. And that is all for my talk, and I'm going to hand it over to Sky now. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ann. Um, I will just go ahead and get this up. All right, does that look good? Looks good here. All right, cool beans. Um, hello, my name is Sky Felicia, and I am a noxious weed specialist with the King County's Noxious Weed Control Program. Um, I'm also the educator consultant for the team. Um, and you'll have to excuse me tonight. I am pretty sick right now, so I'm going to be trying my best. Um, but in addition to my job titles, what you wouldn't see is that I'm also an artsy indigenous woman who really loves food and has pretty deep relationships with most of the plants that I work with. So I'm really excited to be able to step out of my normal Noxious Weeds 101 spiel that I give um, and to bring my passions together and talk about Noxious Weeds and some of their uses and their dangers. So this is the slide I always have on any presentation, which is, are weeds bad all the time? And the answer is no. It's always gonna be subjective. I'm not saying, that weeds are good all of the time, but they're not bad all of the time. There's gonna be times, for instance, in a parking strip, I would prefer weeds than having nothing at all, or the impacts of butterfly bush. It's different in the city than it is on a gravel bar. So it's always gonna be subjective in remembering that weeds are just plants and plants are not capable of ill intentions. So in that case, great, they're just plants. Let nature take its course. This also doesn't apply. Um, and that's for many reasons, but for one, um, all of our noxious weeds that are listed uh, in King County, we have 148 listed right now, they were all introduced here by human beings, either directly or indirectly. So when a plant gets introduced, it gets taken away from its controls that are typically there in its native range, and some of them 
don't become an issue, but some of them do. So it is still our human responsibility to take, take care of noxious weeds as they do have impacts. So are weeds good or bad? We're not gonna talk about that because what we're gonna talk about is five different species, technically six, I slid a bonus in there. And for each species, we're gonna talk about why it's a noxious weed, some plant ID and lookalikes, control methods, and then uses or dangers for the plants. Pretty excited about that. So weeds are fun. Um, the weeds I'm gonna cover will include some natural dyes, some edibles, some that will give you a chemical burn and some that you really don't want to eat. So we're gonna start off with butterfly bush. Butterfly bush, why is it, let me get my laser pointer out. Why is it a noxious weed? So butterfly bush is a class B noxious weed, which means its regulation varies by county. It's also on the prohibited plants list, except for specific sterile cultivars, that in order to have a sterile cultivar that can show up on this list, you do have to prove it. But there is a cultivar that it has less than 2% viable seed. Um, and ways to tell, other than genetic testing, you can actually just look at the base of your butterfly bush plant during the season that seedlings should be popping up. And if there's not seedlings there, that could be the case. Um, but otherwise, they are all on that list because the vast majority of the plants do have a really high seed viability. And the big issue that they pose is on gravel bars and riparian areas. Um, that's personally the only location that I've had to treat them before. Um, and its name is a misnomer. So that's another thing. It's just gets planted like crazy because people are like, it's good for the butterflies. Um, and it does feed adult butterflies, but it does not feed their larvae. So it's bad for the butterfly population overall. And then last impact piece is that each spike can make 40,000 seeds that have 80 to 92% viability. That means success rates in making seedlings. And then each plant, depending on how big it is, thus can produce up to 3 million seeds. And that is a lot of seeds. So to identify this plant, um, we have this really distinctive flower head here. Uh, they tend to nod and kind of droop down when they are on the plant themselves. But as we know, flowers aren't always there. So it's always good to understand a solid leaf and stem ID. Um, the leaves of the butterfly bush, this is how I first learned butterfly bush was that it had these bigger set of opposite leaves and then the smaller ones and that that looked like butterfly wings. Um, it's not always the case, but that still helps me out sometimes. But in general, leaves are always going to be opposite, lance shape, and then the underside of the leaves are this bluish gray color from fuzzy hairs. Um, and then the flowers, if you look more closely at them, they have four petals in this an orange center. But note that the flowers themselves, like the whole spikes, can be purple most often. They can also be pink, orange, or white. And a look-alike to watch for is common lilac, which is not a noxious weed. Um, one thing is, of course, if you smell it, common lilac is just much more fragrant. Um, but also it has these heart-shaped leaves um, that aren't hairy. They don't have the fuzz underneath. And then if you feel the actual petals of the flowers, they're a little bit more stiff. So to control butterfly bush, again, these parts I'm going to cover a little briefly just for the sake of making sure that we can, you know, talk about IPM things. Um, but the controls for butterfly bush, it will be like any woody species. So it will depend on the plant's growth stage. So any new growth that doesn't have an extensive root system yet, you can pull it out. For less soil disturbance, use a specialized tool like a weed wrench. Um, for smaller plants or even some bigger ones, you can do a cut and treat method. Uh, to do that, you're going to want to make a fresh cut on the plant, either with snips or with an actual saw of sorts, depending on the size. Just cut it uh, pretty low to the ground. And the key is to apply the concentrated herbicide while the cut is still fresh, because if you wait even just an hour, it will heal over itself. So being mindful there. And then um, last, for really mature ones that are two inches or more, you could use an easy eject, which is a specialized lance tool that has these little bullets that are open-ended like tin cans, um, and they have a concentrated herbicide in there. So once you can inject them into the tree with this tool, then it sends the herbicide up through its tree veins and then back down, and then it dies. For this one, you don't cut it down first. You can also girdle, but if you're going to girdle a tree, 
No, you have to be really thorough, almost as thorough as you see in this photo here, um, because if you leave any remaining pieces, it'll form what's called a bridge in the center, and we don't want that. But now for the excited part, uses. Okay, so butterfly bush, it blew my mind, but it creates the most incredible yellow color. Um, and it is a weed control support. It's not a full weed control method, but a way to prevent seeds as each seed head can make 40,000 seeds. I probably took at least a dozen flower heads here just to make this dye batch, um, and it made a lot. So, of course, that is not going to be a full control. That is just suppression, but still a cool combination. So, making yellow dyes. I'm going to have this box on any of the slides about dyes, um, but I'll only mention it once. General dye things. I didn't know this until recently, but you need to have a separate bowl and pot for your dye things, especially if you ever want to add extra amendments and things that can make your color stronger. Those aren't always food safe and the plants or mushrooms, whatever you use, aren't always food safe. So separate dye bowl, separate pot, that is best. Um, and then you're also going to want to prep your fabric beforehand because I dyed a few things and then lost all of the color because I didn't prep it ahead of time. I now use what's called alum or aluminum sulfate, A-L-U-M. But there's a bunch of different types of mordants, it's just a way to prep your fabric to make it um, ready for dyes. So the steps of dyeing with flowers, um, pretty generally, is that, of course, you'll harvest them. Um, typically, flowers will make a more strong color, and you could use the leaves and stems of butterfly bush, for instance, but it's not going to be as strong of a color. So I just use flowers in this situation. You put your flowers in the pot, cover it with water, so essentially a one-to-one -one ratio of water, bring it to a boil, lower it to a simmer for 30 minutes, and then I just kind of let it sit and soak overnight. The next day is when I did, oh, lost my mouse, it was when I uh, strained it just into a normal strainer, um, and then that is your dye, is whatever is left. You can just get rid of the solids in the garbage. Because remembering, if you're disposing of weed parts, any reproductive parts you should put in the garbage because the compost doesn't get hot enough to kill them. But uh, so to move forth, I like to just use a mason jar, put my fabric in, and then sit it outside and let the sun do the work. You can leave it for a few hours. I like to leave it overnight. And then you take it out. And then another key thing is that you can rinse it, but you don't want to fully wash it right away. I like to let my stuff sit for about two days and sit away from the sun so it can really set into the fabric. And yeah, that's how you use butterfly bush. And you can use any of the flower colors. It doesn't just have to be the purple ones. Um, any of the flower colors have this chemical component that give you that yellow dye. The flu. And weeds are a fun part too. Next weed we're gonna talk about is garlic mustard. So we talked all about weed classes in Anne's talk. Um, so we're gonna be talking about a class A noxious weed, garlic mustard, which is one of the more infamous weeds that people know that you can eat, but I knew that you could eat them for a while and I didn't. So I just wanna kind of demystify that. First, let's talk about their impacts for one. Um, they have a significantly earlier growth than a lot of our native plants. Like they're already making seeds by June, sometimes May. They can also thrive in relatively undisturbed forests, which is unique since a lot of our weeds prefer disturbed areas. They can thrive in the shade. I've had to pull trash bags full of flowering garlic mustard in dense shade cover. It's wild. Um, and then they can make a lot of seeds that are viable for five plus years. And these seeds are viable because they're self-fertile, which is also wild. Um, and then lastly, they're allelopathic. Uh, of course, there's always studies coming out on this, but that's what it means whenever they're disrupting the certain beneficial plant-fungi relationships. So they're sending out these chemical messages that are reaching these fungi saying, hey, we're growing here. And essentially, it ends up impacting what of the other species can go around it. So it ends up impacting our tree seedling success rates. And that is why, in addition to not being super widespread yet, this plant is required for eradication statewide and on the prohibited plants list. So for identifying garlic mustard, um, garlic mustard is in the mustard family. It's a two-year plant. So anytime we have a two-year plant, just keeping in mind that there's going to be two 
life cycles happening at all times. So if you have a flowering plant, you probably will also have a rosette underneath because the rosette will become flowering next year. That one will die, new seedling. And it's just this ongoing cycle. So knowing how to identify them at both stages is very helpful. Also helps you prioritize your work. But to identify garlic mustard, um, the keys are gonna be in the leaves. And that's really with any plant because flowers are helpful, but it's ideal to get to weeds before they flower. So for garlic mustard, the leaves are very thin. They're also pretty textured and they have wavy edges. And I'm differentiating this from serrated because serrated edges come to points of the tips and wavy, it just stays as a pretty smooth wave. On its rosette form, it stays in this kidney shaped leaf, but they become more triangular as you go up the stem. And then once it's time for them to have flowers, make these cute little flower clusters to have these tiny, tiny white flowers with four petals. And then their seed pods are like many of the mustard family, these slender seed pods that start as green and then they eventually will turn brown and send their seeds out. And then the last thing that isn't on here is the smell of them. That's also really helpful. If you're distinguishing it from lookalikes and you're not super certain, if you take the leaf and crush it, it does have a garlicky smell. So a lookalike, I'm proud of this lookalike photo, I will say. This is annual honesty or Lunaria. Um, this is the one that has the, it's also known as Chinese money plant. It has the discs of seed pods and um, the bright purple flowers. But whenever it's young, it's pretty hard to tell them apart. So you'll notice if you can look closely that there's some fuzz on this lookalike plant. And also if you look at the edges, they come to kind of tips at the end, whereas garlic mustard stays as that wavy fashion. Yeah. So garlic mustard controls, um, like anything less disturbance of the soil, the better. Um, there was studies in the Washington State Noxious Weed paper that I was looking at um, about how it might actually be more effective to do less soil disturbance and remove less of the rosettes if you must, because if you are just like tearing up the soil, you might just be spreading it more. So just be mindful anytime you're doing weed control. And then with this one, it's really important to brush your boots and tools between sites because that's how it shows up into these relatively undisturbed areas. You can dig out the plants pretty easily, always with biennial plants, starting with the second year plants if you need to prioritize your work because they're going to make the seeds. And also knowing that those first year plants have wimpier roots. So really being careful and getting that root out. Um, sheet mulching is also effective when combined with any other method. Um, and that's just going to be putting a layer, paper layer of cardboard newspaper, and then a thick layer of heavy mulch. Um, and then also if you need to for bigger infestations, chemical treatments are an option. Um, we'll usually do treatments in the spring uh, with glyphosate. You could also do a summer treatment. Um, and or a fall rosette treatment. But for all of these, once the seed pods turn brown, the reason to avoid, um, or at least to take space from it, is because they're the type of seed pods that kind of bust open as they're drying. So you just might end up with more seeds. So the uses, this one's fun. So uses of garlic mustard, um, all parts are edible. And if you look it up on the internet, it'll say there's cyanide but all brassicas have cyanide. Brassicas, you know, being broccoli, cauliflower, all those things, they all contain cyanide. Um, in particular, garlic mustard has more in its first year, but its first year plants are also tastier. So know that with things like cyanide, you can always cook them out, but do your research on your own if you'd like, but I've never had an issue with it. As with any food that you're gonna forage, Always follow ethical harvesting practices. The only thing that you might not have to be as mindful of is over harvesting. Um, Cause that's a big thing when it comes to ethical foraging, you wanna leave things so that they can come back. We don't really want garlic mustard coming back. So uh, the way that I use it is for one, collect the whole plant before they flower. I've tried to take the flowering plants and they're very bitter. Um, all of the parts are cause they put so much energy out towards making the flower that the sugars have drawn up. So. If they haven't gotten the chance to make the flower, they're going to taste better. So going for these first year plants, ideally collect the whole plant, wash them in cold water. If you do it in warm water, those get a little wilty and then freeze them for later use. I've made the mistake before of collecting them after a field day, being tired, putting them dirt and all in the freezer and then washing a frozen plant 
it just ends up becoming essentially like you're just working with a pile of melted spinach. So wash it first, even if you're tired, and then freeze it. I like to separate my roots from my leaves and stems because I use them for different things. Uh, leaves can be used in any way that you would use cooked spinach. Both of these things I used in a lasagna, but um, they have a slightly garlicky flavor, but otherwise they're kind of semi-flavorless like spinach. Um, but you can also use them in combo with any other herbs. I've made a very okay pesto, um, can make herb butter. Just make sure you're combining it with other herbs if you wanna have good flavor with your dish. Um, and then for the roots, these have a really strong horseradishy taste. Um, I have them next to garlic. This isn't the garlic mustard. The garlic mustard roots are the actual root portions right there. Um, main hot tip on that is to know that the parts coming from the stem and going outward, they're a little bit woody or pithy. So I'll use my nails if I haven't eaten them down to nothing or the back of or front of a knife to kind of scrape the usable parts off and then I'll discard the other parts. So hold from the stem, it's stronger scrape it off and then just get rid of that woody stuff. And then you can chop up the rest and just use it as you would in any garlic. All right, so next weed. Now it's time to talk about toxins. Poison hemlock, I'll let you really marinate on that line while I um with my tea. I thought I had COVID but it was this deadly plant invading the US. And this isn't Photoshopped. I was looking at poison hemlock impact for presentation a little while back. And it's not funny that this happened, but it is just kind of, it helps understand the impact that poison hemlock has on the human body um, and why it's a listed noxious weed. Because whenever you ingest poison hemlock, even if you eat it and don't just breathe it in, uh, the effect that it usually has is a respiratory failure problem. But we'll talk more about that. So why it's a noxious weed, of course, it's toxic, uh, hence the name. It also has earlier blooms, not as early as garlic mustard, but still early. And then a big issue is that it looks like an edible food. So it's one thing if it was a toxic plant that doesn't really look like other plants, but this is a toxic plant that looks like carrots, that there are people who are just you know, forage food in general, but it ends up as an equity issue too, because we have a lot more of our communication will be in English talking about toxic plants. And these plants are ones that like disturbed areas show up on roadsides and there are more marginalized communities who live by the roadsides and live by the highways and these other systems. So not surprisingly, poison hemlock shows up more in those communities, gets tended to less in those communities and has less communication. So poison hemlock becomes an equity issue. Um, my other fun fact is that this was Socrates's choice of death, um, was poison hemlock. You can look it up. For identifying this forbidden carrot, um, one, it's in the carrot family. So if you've ever bought a bunch of carrots at the farmer's market or the store that has the leaves, it has very similar leaves because it's in the same family. Most all plants in the carrot family have these umbels or cluster situations of white flowers. But what's really going to tell apart poison hemlock, aside from the fact that it's really tall, I have a whole slide on that, is its stem. Stem is key. Number one, it is completely baby butt smooth, hairless. There are no hairs on this stem. It has these purple splotches and streaks. When they're younger, it's a little bit less obvious and more blended. Um, but if you look closely, you'll at least be able to see some. It doesn't have any ridges and it is completely hollow. So stem is very helpful. Next thing is that it is a two-year plant. So like with the garlic mustard, the first and second year growth stages exist at one time. So our first year plants are gonna be rosettes. This is probably actually a second year rosette. It's just a better visual. Um, they're gonna start off as these small rosettes with a few leaves. They'll go dormant over winter. And then come the next spring, they're gonna bolt, which is grow upwards like lettuce, create these flowers and seeds, and then they die. So if you can see how there's greenery at the bottom of these dead canes, these are the rosettes that are starting for the next year. And there's probably little rosettes under here. And there's probably bigger plants around here. So they're always coexisting. So for the dangers of things, oh, I'm realizing my slides are a little bit out of order. We'll push through it. So for the dangers of things, 
Um, the forbidden carrot is death by respiratory failure, um, but it's most dangerous if eaten. So there is a lot of fear mongering that happens around poison hemlock. And while it is a very scary plant because it can be fatal, it is really mostly just if eaten is the number one concern because six to eight leaves could kill a person. The seeds and roots are even more toxic. Um, common symptoms of poisoning are going to be the classic symptoms of any poisoning, which is dilated pupils, being lightheaded, um, your mouth kind of watering, trembling, muscle pain, weakness, dizziness. Monitor your symptoms. As long as you don't have any symptoms that are truly concerning, you should be fine. You can always call the poison hotline. If you know for a fact that you or someone has consumed this plant, go to the ER, please. Um, skin irritation is possible from the sap, but that really goes with a lot of plants. With any plants, it's always best to wear your protective equipment and your gloves and your sleeves because you never know what sap is going to be an irritant to your skin, but it's not poisonous in the way that giant hogweed is. Um, and then another danger that is less spoken of, but is still a serious problem, and the second most common way that people get sick or die from this plant is from plant particles, typically from mowing or burning the plants. Um, this happens whenever the plants get blended up or disintegrated in some fashion, and they become really small so that you can breathe them in. It's going to depend on the situation. I have heard of people who have told me angrily over the phone that they've been mowing for years and that's great. Um, it's not great. You probably shouldn't be doing that, but I guess they're fine. But I've heard better reports of people who mow with, you know, the big cab from um, whenever you're on a farm, the cab portion of things, sick brain. Um, but just avoid mowing it if you can. It's really a not a great control method but B, it could cause some issues. And then last personal anecdote, don't transport it in the cab of your car. I did this once when I had too many bags of poison hemlock and I just put it in the back of my car to bring to the dump and I got really sick. So don't do that. And here's where the slide mix up comes in that I mentioned. This is continuing the plant ID part. So the stem is key. So give yourself a moment there and see if you can suss out which one it is or even what the other ones are if you're really into it. Three, two, one. Ah! Again, the key here, it's hairless and smooth. Uh, it has the purple splotches and streaks. This is more of a continuous purple. There's no deep ridges here. Um, and again, it's pretty distinct overall. Another thing about the stem, I think it's a little bit of a dusty green color too, behind the purple spots. And then the last plant ID situation would be the fact that it is huge. All of its lookalikes get usually max four feet. Poison hemlock's average minimum, other than the weird mode stuff, is six feet. So it's another thing. If you see it on the side of the road and it's really low growing and it's flowering, unless it's something that's been mowed, it's probably not poison hemlock. The only lookalike that has been popping up more often for us here in King County has been uh, fennel, which is more of a weed in California. It's kind of a phenomenon I've noticed a lot this year. I don't know about y'all, but that is the only one that it does have a similar height situation, but they have yellow flowers um, and the stem doesn't have any purple spots. So lastly, controls of poison hemlock. Um, like any of the second year plants, prioritize the balting plants and then get the rosettes if you have time. If you're past that and there's already seeds present, that means the plant is dying. If you really want to do something, you can focus on the rosettes or you could just come back the next spring. But in general, less soil disturbance is better. Brushing your boots, digging them out. They're actually pretty easy to dig out because they have that carrot tap root. So as long as you get the main root, you're pretty good. If they're already flowering, you'll just want to cut off the flower head, put those in a bag, throw those in the trash, and then you can dig out the rest. Um, and then with chemical, we will spray it with triclopure typically in the early, early spring. Here's my bonus plant. Honorable mention, Queen Anne's Lace, also known as wild carrot. This plant I'm mentioning because it is something that comes up anytime you look up poison hemlock. So I just wanted to cover it really quick. Because also it has a lot of fun uses and per its name, wild carrot is edible. So carrot family, uh, the main ID difference is here. It has a lot of stiff white hairs. 
um, and a pretty solidly green stem. Sometimes close to the junctions, it'll have a little purplish tinge, but nothing major that you could notice from afar. Its leaves are those lacy carrot-like leaves. They look even more like a store-bought carrot. Um, and its flower head, it has a similar flower head situation. A lot of times they're a little bit more flat topped than in this photo, but the key here is that they have a tutu. Um, these are the bracts, those modified leaf situations. So flower head with a tutu and they smell like carrots. This one I'm really just covering uses because again, there's so many. Um, Queen Anne's Lace Wild Carrot, this plant is an issue mostly for agriculture because it is actually a very specific sub um, subspecies that is excluded from the noxious weed list because it is one that uh, agriculture uses to grow as carrots. Um, and there's an issue with them hybridizing among other things. Otherwise, these tend to show up on roadsides and they can displace native wildflowers. But in terms of their uses, all parts are edible. And then they make a different, a bunch of different colored uh, dyes. It's gonna be the same exact process as I mentioned for butterfly bush, but the cool bonus here is that if you add things either before or after to your dye bath, you can make some really crazy colors. I didn't do this. I had a pretty okay tan fabric come out. It was nice. I dyed some of my really weird looking white shirts tan because I don't like how bright they are. But if you want an actual color, you can add different things to your dye afterwards, but look more into this, of course. Another activity that people do is just cut the stems and then put them into dyed water and they'll bring up the color, kind of how roses do. And then lastly, you can eat all parts of them. Um, if you want to consume the carrot part of the plant, you'll wanna do that as we did with um, garlic mustard before they bolt so that they're not bitter. But if you are like me and procrastinated and then the plant suddenly had flowers, you can eat the flower heads. I got this recipe from Black Forager on Instagram. She's fantastic. Um, and I just made a really simple sticky batter with a vegan buttermilk, which was just oat milk and lemon, some flour. I just used some soda water for my fridge, seasonings, dipped it in, and then you fried it. And it was honestly delicious and kind of just tasted like carrot fritters. Okay, and next, Himalayan blackberry. So this one, I probably don't need to emphasize as much of why it's a noxious weed. Um, I have a feeling if you are at this presentation right now, you probably know why it's a noxious weed. But just to go through the basics, it is difficult to control once it's established. It spreads readily by animals, including humans. Um, it can clone itself from really anything. Um, it grows these thorny canes that can be an issue for humans, but also uh, for animals as well. It can become an impenetrable thicket that just restricts any sort of movement. It can grow really fast and it can grow really anywhere. I've seen blackberry growing in the craziest places. Um, and then once it is established, it makes it really hard for other species to establish. One, because it's taken a lot of the nutrients and used it um, to survive on its own. But two, it has such a crazy root system happening under there that it's hard for other plants to establish. And just to talk more about the access thing, this was a volunteer event that me and a couple of my coworkers did with the Duwamish River Coalition uh, that we were clearing the sidewalk headed to the fair because it had grown over like six feet and there was no way that a wheelchair could pass through the area. So it can become an accessibility issue as well. So for Himalayan blackberry ID, its root balls are huge. Um, flowers that has the five petaled white or pink flowers. Its stem is pretty boxy. When it's younger, it's not quite as boxy, um, but its uh, thorns still stay pretty woody. You can also look out for the five leaflets, whereas the native blackberry has three leaflets. And then of course it's berries. Um, Himalayan blackberry was introduced here on purpose uh, by the per same person who introduced the russet potato with the hopes of creating a blackberry that was going to have no thorns. He did a really bad job. They're also not from the Himalayas. Blackberry controls. Um, this is a non-regulated weed. So weed controls encouraged, but not required. Um, 
But no matter what, anytime you work with BlackBerry, just plan for regrowth because it will come back no matter how well you did and it's not personal. The typical method will be digging out the root balls. This is what we'll call grubbing in the field. That's just to cut it down low and that's just so it doesn't hit you in the face. You use the shovel, hit it on all ends, and then you'll hear the pops of the root system underneath and then just get this big root ball out. It's really satisfying. You could also cut and treat. A good method for larger infestations is to cut it first, usually with a brush cutter, maybe with a tri-blade, and then let the plants grow until they have two sets of leaflets. And then you can spray that new growth either in late summer or fall. Um, you can also just spray the stand on its own. It just depends on how big it is. Sometimes that's really a pain to walk through, in which case you can make a path with your brushing tool instead of brushing the whole area. You'll just have to come back for that cut area because spraying the stems won't be effective because it's not concentrated enough. Um, and then lastly, you could just cut it several times a year for several years, but this actually won't kill it. This will just suppress it. So I wouldn't do that. So now for the uses, of course, I'm not putting a slide on eating the berries. Y'all know how to eat berries, I hope. And you can, of course, add it to any recipe that you would use berries in. The only place that it might be a little different is just concern of whether or not it's been sprayed. To be straight up, there's no definitive way to say yes or no, this hasn't been sprayed. Um, but you can just use your best judgment or try to harvest from places that you know that they don't spray there. But if you're not sure, like if you're at a park of sorts, um, if it is recent enough, you'll be able to see traces of blue dye because the undersides of the leaves are like a grayish color from the hairs. Just look close towards wherever the leaves are pointing down for traces of blue dye. If they're wilting or curling in a really dramatic way, that could be a sign or if there's signage nearby. But if you're not sure and you're not comfortable, just don't do it. Otherwise, always wash any fruit that you harvest um, or any plants because of course, herbicide, but also things like dog pee. So to use blackberry as a dye, berries are a little bit different than using flowers. And that's because they already have a lot of juices, um, but they also have a lot more pigment. So I double the water ratio. So here I tried to take a screen grab from my video that I made uh, that I used essentially it's almost like a rice pot method to where the berries are at the bottom and then I just try to double the amount of water that was in the pan to the berries from the top. I hope that made sense. Um, did the same thing to where I brought it to a boil, lowered it to a simmer halfway. I mashed it up a little bit to get some more color out and then also let that sit overnight. The next day I strained out the solids. Um, I've heard that people have used this portion to feed their chickens if you have chickens. I don't, so it went in the garbage. Um, cause you don't want to throw this into your garden. That's all seeds. Um, and then it turned into this really fun dye. No, this one is, I learned recently, uh, known as a fugitive dye, which means that the dye fades, um, from the sun and from washing. I thankfully prepped this fabric. So I got a good amount of it to stick. But if you look at other people who have dyed with blackberries online, sometimes it'll turn out to be a grayish lavender color, which I still think is pretty cool. And last but not least, we have giant hogweed. I'm gonna take another sip of my tea. Also, I'm gonna look at the Q&A. Is there any information on how long seeds for each species are viable in the soil? Yes, for most of the species, if you look on our website, uh, King County Noxious Weeds or the State Noxious Weed Board site, there's usually information on that um, if it is something that is important. Otherwise, you can also look into the research findings that's typically linked in the additional resources section, and that'll tell you something. But otherwise, the internet is just a really great resource. And I'll note that, that I should include that for next time. And I've heard animals or livestock can get sick if poison hemlock is growing in or near their water source. I honestly, I, I am not familiar with that, but that's not to say that isn't true. So maybe if somebody else, I'm going to write answer live so it shows up hopefully on y'all's end. I have also heard of that. Okay. Um, do you want to speak yeah. to that for a second, Anne? 
So I don't know all the details, but I, I've heard multiple times, multiple people, um, that livestock have died from drinking from creeks where there were um, hemlock upstream. Um, I don't think very far upstream, I think closer. Um, also, like if hemlock gets cut and then the, I guess, the cell fluids from that cut gets into the water. Yeah, no, I, I guess I've heard it come up one other time. I'm just not familiar with it. So thank you, Anne. And that sounds horrible. And I'm sorry to the person who asked. I wish I could give more information. Okay, so giant hogweed. Um, this first burn photo isn't really bad. I just I just wanted to make sure I was, you know, looking out for people who didn't want to see it. So I'm releasing it in three, two, one. Oh, come on. Okay, um, so giant hogweed, it is a noxious weed because it is a serious public health hazard. Um, it is a phytophototoxic plant, which phytolight, I mean, phyto plant, photo light. So sap plus sun equals burns and blisters. And the way that the sap is released is from breaking plant parts. So that could be crushing leaves, cutting the stem, crushing flowers, any plant part that gets broken, it's gonna release any sap. And there couldn't be sap also on the exterior of the plant. It's just really gonna come out once you open it. So the issue with giant hogweed, well, for one, it is a class A weed. So eradication is required statewide, but it's also been on the weed list for quite some time. So this has been being tracked for decades. So at least in King County, I know that we're aware of most, most infests, but please still report it if you see it, because um, we would love to make sure that we are on top of all of those infestations. And the way that the plant works is that it has these toxins that are UV reactive called foranocoumarins, probably botching that. Um, but it causes photosensitivity or light sensitivity that can end up in these really dramatic second, third degree burns. So 15 minutes after the sap contacts your skin um, and then peaking between 30 minutes and two hours after, your skin becomes really sensitive to light in the way that you're not just gonna get sunburn, you're gonna end up getting a real burn. And these burns, I can speak from one of my coworkers experiences, every summer when the sun gets you know hot, the, her burns are still sensitive and it's been a couple of years now. So to identify giant hogweed, um, one, it's in the carrot family, so we still have that white clustery flower head. They're just clearly gigantic. Uh, they typically have one main flowering stem, and they can get 10 to 20 feet tall, hence giant. The leaves can get two to five feet wide, and they look to me like they're cut kind of like Christmas snowflakes with scissors. Um, they're not fuzzy, and they have these sharp lobes, and then the flower is umbrella-like but in a real size sense. The stem is really gonna be key here in addition to the leaves, because a lot of the giant hogweed that you'll see, giant hogweed does end up flowering, but it takes about two to four years. And sometimes it dies afterwards. So you're not gonna see a lot of flowering giant hogweed, especially cause we're on top of it. So knowing how to identify it whenever it's in its leaf, um, leafy forms is gonna be key. So we got the leaves there, the stems, they're going to have this reddish purple spot situation. Sometimes it's more spread, such as here. But sometimes, when it's like this, it gets me. Uh, it will be an almost mostly green stem to where the dark purple spots will come to where near the hairs are coming out. Which these hairs are stiff. They're white. They're kind of long relative to its lookalike, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but they can get pretty big. This is my hand next to it truly a huge plant. So the lookalike uh, will be cow parsnip. Cow parsnip is a native plant, but it has the same type of toxins as giant hogweed. It just is much less severe. It's not as strong. So giant hogweed gets 10 to 20 feet tall. Cow parsnip is three to 10 feet tall. Noting that, yes, there is that point to where if cow parsnip is at its tallest or giant hogweed is at its shortest, they might be the same height. Um, but that's why you need to learn how to identify the difference with the leaves and the stems. So the stems, again, it's stiff white hairs versus these more fine white hairs that look more fuzzy. Also on cow parsnip, when I've seen it, 
it will have this purplish color and might even be a stronger purple color too, but it's almost always pretty smooth. It's more of a gradient versus these spots. And then for the size, cow parsnip will be pinky to thumb width, maybe a little bit bigger, whereas giant hogweed, whenever it's a little bit more mature, will be wrist to arm width. When it's young, of course, it'll still be small, but I'm talking about the mature plants. Um, and then also this crown of white hairs is a pretty helpful identifier because while cow parsnip has it as well, it is just much more intense and you can really tell apart those stiff white hairs there. As for the leaves, um, the leaves are more jagged. Of course, it's always easier to tell plants apart when they're side by side but the leaves are more jagged of giant hogweed. And for cow parsnip, what's been a helpful idea for me is that it has these three sets almost of leaflets to where there's two down here across from each other, two in the center, and then one at the top. So even if it's more in size, if I could tell that it has those three main separations, it's pretty helpful. Um, also the top of the cow parsnip leaves are fuzzy, whereas the top of giant hogweed leaves are completely hairless. And then of course, giant hogweed is just bigger overall. So in terms of dangers and exposure, because exposure does happen, um, let's talk about that. Again, these burns are a little bit more grody. So I'm warning you in three, two, one. Um, so giant hogweed, it can cause these major burns. And what you should do for one is immediately wash the area with soap and cold water. Ways to make sure this can happen will be making sure you have soap and water at your field site. It's ideal, it wants you to wash it for 15 to 30 minutes. I know that at the field site you won't be able to do that, but that is better than nothing and then getting yourself to a sink that you can wash it. Um, you'll wanna protect it from sunlight for at least 48 hours because again, those toxins, your skin becomes sensitive for the 30 minutes to two hours after, that's when it's at its peak, but it could be for several days. So 48 plus hours, protect it from sunlight and not just with a long sleeve shirt because that doesn't fully protect you from UV. You're gonna wanna wear a sun protective shirt, something that says it protects you from UV. Um, Sunscreen, maybe, but that also could be irritating if it's already irritated. And then, yes, of course, the reality, there's no way to do it right away. Cover your skin. Don't touch it because those are oils. And um, make finding a wash station your priority. So PMs and crew leads, if you have a crew member who says, I think I have giant got touched giant hogweed, don't say do it after lunch or on your next break. Just let them go ahead. And then you also as a crew member, anybody who does this, advocate for yourself, go wash it off. That's your priority. Um, yes. And then no matter what, even if you get to washing it, you'll just want to monitor that area. And um, it will start with a reddening of skin. And then by day two, that's when blisters will form. This is obviously further in this person's unfortunate journey. Um but just noting that this is a chemical burn, so treat it as such, which means if it's infected, go to the ER or to urgent care. But hopefully you don't have to do this at all because you now know how to confidently identify it and you're not gonna accidentally work with it without protective gear on or all willy nilly, you'll be fine. But when it comes to controls, um, avoid exposure, learn your plant ID, um, and know that if it's in King County, our program, that has been a focus of our program for a while. Class A's are very much in our ballpark. So if it's in King County, don't even worry about that. Please reach out to us and we can at least guide, if not most likely just control it for you. Um, but if you know that you're working on it and it's within your field project specs, make sure you're covering all of your skin and protecting your eyes when working with the plant. Because if you've been in the field, you know how many times plants suddenly grow physical abilities and hit you in the face, which happens more often than it should. Protect your eyes at all costs, protect your skin, and then keep soap and water on site. When it comes to manual control, of course, these little ones, you don't need to cut them down. You can just dig them out. But for the larger ones, you're going to want to cut down that main stem first, a little closer to the root, um, and being mindful as you're digging it out because your face will be going in and out trying to dig this plant. So you don't want that fresh cut stem with the sap on your face. Um, and then you'll want to dig it out. It'll have a lot of auxiliary roots. 
you're really focused on this main route. As long as you can get as much of that out as possible, you should be good. Um, fill in the hole when you're done because, you know, disturbance will just bring up more. And then for chemical treatments, um, we've used in the springtime when it's still smaller form, triclopure at 1 to 1 1.5%. And then this, I will say injecting, I've never injected hogweed. I will say that to be honest, but methods that you will find on the label for Roundup Pro Concentrate would be to inject five milliliters of a 5% solution into the leaf cane, not the actual cane. And that would be because the actual cane is too thick. Um, and this will be using a more complex needle per se. So in conclusion, plants are really complex. And just because a plant is a noxious weed, it doesn't mean this is a bad plant. But that said, just because a noxious weed has these uses, it doesn't mean that we need to advocate for keeping it around. It's always gonna be subjective and we need to make sure that we are still putting the environment, human safety, the economy, all of these things, keeping them in mind as we're moving forward with our work. So we can appreciate weeds for their nuances and we don't have to hate them for their consequences. Hating plants is silly. If I hated plants, my job would be really exhausting because um, plants are not capable of having ill intentions. They were all brought here by humans and it is our responsibility to do something about it. And then here's me with a giant hogweed umbrella. And that's all I got. So sorry if I'm a little short, Anna. I was trying not to go over, and I think I did a little too well. That's okay. Um, I don't know if Susan Bird would like to start early or if we want to take a few minute break. Maybe I'll quickly address the Q and A. Okay. Um, would you suggest to wear a face shield when dealing with hogweed? It's totally up to you. I've never done that myself, but. I'm sure that it wouldn't be a bad idea. The only issue I could see is just from COVID airport days is imagining it getting really foggy when you're working. Cause I know my eye probe gets foggy when I'm working. So that might just be annoying. I would probably opt to just do eye pro and then carefully dig it out. But if it makes you feel more safe, then like, absolutely. Um, how common is it in Western Washington? I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about giant hogweed. And it's not incredibly common. And we have tracked most of the infestations that exist. Um, I don't have an exact number on how many sites we have, but they've been just, you know, getting lower and lower through the years. We don't have very often that we open new giant hogweed sites. Let's see. Um, but yeah, otherwise, were there any questions in the chat? Yeah, Sky, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, Um. yes. And it looks like Susan did answer about the butterfly bush seeds being put into, um, into the garbage. Yeah, municipal compost does not get hot enough still. Uh, the garbage, because if you think about it, it's melting down just anything. Uh, it will get a lot hotter. Whereas our compost, for one, it doesn't get hot enough. But two, there's a lot of companies like Cedar Grove that will source their compost and mulch from city composting facilities. And that's how we'll see a lot of weeds end up in people's gardens. Let's see, is there anything else? I don't think so, unless I'm missing something. Pretty much. I commented it went in doubt. on someone's question. Awesome. Thanks so much, Susan. Okay. Well, um, it's totally your call, Anne, what you wanted to do with... Uh... Um, really quick, I want to say pretty much if you're in doubt about what to do with the noxious weeds that you've removed and you want to throw them out or compost them, reach out to the local company, your local mu municipality, whoever runs your local compost or your local transfer station and see what they can take and how... Uh, some places will take certain noxious weeds for free at the dump. So it's always worth it to reach out to see if you can dispose of your tansy ragwort for free. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Awesome. Sweet. There was a question that popped up. Uh, any suggestions for reed canary grass removal? Um, it's tough. Uh, 
I, um, on my property, I am going with the cultural method of letting my trees grow up and eventually we'll shade it out. It's going to take a long time, but that's what I'm doing. Um, herbicide is effective. Um, I forget the exact name. Sethodoxum, I think, is effective on reed canary grass, and uh, I've used Fusilade on reed canary grass. Um, controlled burns are really good to kill can reed canary grass. It's just, um, that's a lot of resources. Uh, so I guess probably like one of those like fire weed eaters, that's also an option for smaller amounts. Um, you can cover an area with cardboard or weed tarp and then mulch and plant in. That's another option. Other people probably have other uh experience with reed canary grass <laughs> uh, see andrea asks, is yard waste burned or composted um at at like facilities i think it's composted so check with the facility um and if you want to burn your own yard waste make sure that you're allowed to do so because <laughs> of like burn bans and where you are which, yeah, and then the compost at municipal facilities, it will still, like, the process of compost composting when it's just piled up will create combustion, so it will get hot in that way, even if it's not an intentional burn, which is what we usually mean when we say it doesn't get hot enough to kill the seeds. I don't know if you want to get started a little bit early and sure or it might or, take me a second to get this loaded or and did you want to give folks maybe like a few minute break if anything yeah how about everybody come back at 5 30 um so yep. a six minute break based on my clock that works oh and Anne Gretchen asked how do we get a copy of this recording um so Maria is recording it um yes uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I will send an email to all the participants or anyone who registered on Zoom uh, will get an email with a link to the recording. It ultimately will be on YouTube and uh, we'll probably have a web page for it. But yeah, regardless, if you signed up for the Zoom meeting or the Zoom webinar, then you will get a copy of the recording. Great. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I hope everybody can see and hear things well. Um, I'm Susan Bird. I've been an inspector for noxious weed control for Yakima County since 2003. 
And um, today I'm just going to talk about some problem weeds, noxious and non-noxious um, in crops in Eastern Washington. So this one, this first slide here is mustard in an apple orchard. And we were contacted and said, uh, you know, we can't access our field. And the mustard was coming from 300 acres of property slated for development. So they thought they could leave it alone and it wasn't a noxious weed, so they didn't have to do anything. So even though it may not be on the noxious weed list, it can still be somebody's nightmare. So it's might be a concern for a neighbor or detrimental to crops and livestock nearby. So agricultural weeds, any plant growing where it's not wanted is a weed especially in agricultural settings. So in this picture, there are two natives, foxtail barley and tall sea blight, um, both of which are native, but they're both aggressively invading this forage pasture. So it's competing with desirable forages. They're very difficult to control. They got out of control before they really realized that they had a problem. So all of the blonde looking uh, appearance out through here if I can find a pointer. All of this blonde stuff throughout this pasture is a native foxtail barley. And then the more coarse looking plants are tall sea blight. Again, it's another native. So they're both weedy. They both have um, very aggressive spreading tendencies and they're both difficult to control. So even though they're natives, they are considered weeds in this situation. Uh, Anne spoke earlier about Palmer amaranth being new to Washington state, and it is edible. It is a flowering plant. If anyone eats quinoa, you're eating this one's cousin. So it does grow very aggressively up to eight feet tall. Um, it grows very well in irrigated farmland, but it does well in dry land as well. The two sites that it was found, um, one site was about 150 plants down near the Tri-Cities in an irrigated hayfield. The other plant was outside of an irrigated area in a dry land, and they were doing very well. They weren't quite as tall, they weren't quite as aggressive, but they do very well in both um, aquatic, you know, irrigated farmland as well as dry land. So it's definitely one to be watching for. Um, they can produce up to a million seeds per year, so multiple flushes of seeds per growing season. And in this picture, the one on the right is a female. And the one on the left is a male, and the female definitely produces more um, aggressive seeding habits. It can be toxic to livestock. It's an alkaloid binder, and so alkaloids can cause some significant issues with livestock. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, seeds are viable on this one for up to five years, possibly longer, depending on soil conditions. So, excuse me, someone earlier mentioned seed viability. And it does have a lot to do with the conditions. Eastern Washington, the soils are dry, um, not a lot of water to help seeds rot. And so unless it's in an irrigated area, viability might be a little higher in some areas than in others. So something to keep in mind. Um, Anne mentioned the petiole length on the leaf is longer on the Palmer amaranth than it is on say red root pigweed or some of the other amaranths that are known in Washington state. They also have this little watermark on the leaves. Um, some of them are more obvious than others. So that's another sign to look for. And then the Palmer amaranth is really smooth as opposed to the smooth pigweed, which is really fuzzy, um, kind of a contrary in identification. So just a few things to pick it out from the other amaranths that are very prevalent in Eastern Washington. So this next one is another native. Mare's tail or horseweed, also known as butteweed um, or colt's tail, is native to eastern Washington, eastern Oregon. It's pretty common throughout Idaho. Uh, it's one of the ancient plants that just has survived eternity. They used to be much larger. However, uh, they're very aggressive in areas that are open to sunlight. And so you find these in fields after harvest. You'll go out into a grain field where they have already harvested and we'll see a flush of mare's tail. Mare's tail is naturally resistant to multiple groups of herbicides, so it's difficult to control. 
and it's very fuzzy. So you have to use a really good surfactant if you're going to be controlling mare's tail. Because it is native, it is not on anyone's noxious weed list. It's an annual. It can get up to six feet tall. The flowers form these real fluffy little seeds that carry for miles in the wind. So it spreads very rapidly, especially in windy areas, open areas. Uh, you can mow this early and prevent, you know, just keep it mowed, keep it short. It'll still go to seed. However, it'll prevent it from being as aggressive of a seeder if you mow it pre-bolt. Um, it will germinate in the fall and winter over and grow and bolt in the spring. So um, it's one of those plants that you have to be cautious with the type of herbicide because it has some natural resistances. So you need to know which, which products you want to use um, in order to get a good control if you're, if you're trying to do a spray control. This is a soybean field where the mare's tail is kind of taking over. And this is a good picture of the fluffy little flowers as it starts to go. It will compete with water. Um, so it's very drought hardy, produces multiple seed flushes per year in one growing season and uh, mowing equipment will spread it. Traffic driving by it will spread it. So it's very aggressive spreader. The, the farmers in the Yakima Valley have said it's the worst weed in the state and it should be on the list whether it's native or not. So this next one is very, very prevalent throughout Eastern Washington. It is kochia. It is an allelopathic plant. So it changes the soil chemistry. Nothing else likes to grow around it. It loves disturbed areas. It starts out real small and kind of fuzzy. It'll grow up to six feet tall. There's a lot of different names for kochia, um, burning bush, cow candy, mock cypress, Mexican fireweed. It burns very hot when it's dry, so it becomes a fire hazard or a fire issue. It thrives in marginal soils, so saline, alkaline, pH levels being a little off, kochia does really well. It is also uh, resistant to a couple different types and, and modes of herbicide, and so when you start getting resistance with kochia, um, it's kind of hard to control when you've got a, a Roundup Ready or a a certain resistance in some crops, kochia likes those crops too. So we have to be careful that we're not creating more resistance by um, spraying with something that it's already got a little bit of a resistance to. It does germinate in early summer, but it will germinate year round. We're seeing small kochia seedlings in the fall or in places where we have done a weed control for another plant and left an open area, kochia will move in pretty quickly. You can control kochia with early tillage before it bolts, um, keeping it mowed pretty short. Eventually, it'll it'll kind of die without producing seed. Um, but this is a couple pictures. This one's in a wheat field, so it does really well in dry areas. That is an irrigated wheat field, but they've obviously let it dry off. Uh, this is in a canola field where it is irrigated. And this one is where one kochia plant that was resistant rolled across this field and they had treated and, and done a fallow treatment for this entire field. And you can see where that one mother kochia just rolled around and created this line of resistant uh, baby kochia. And there's a few little ones out there that were missed as well, but this one line is really obvious for how kochia will move and spread it breaks off, tumbles in the wind. It is a common tumbleweed in Eastern Washington. And this one is the bane of every wildland firefighter in Washington state in the Northwest. So cheatgrass or downy brome is a huge fire hazard, especially in our rangelands. It comes in, it takes over in open areas. So anything that is disturbed, downy brome seems to be the first grass that comes up. It is not listed as a noxious weed. It is naturalized throughout the Western U.S. Um, control options on this one, follow-up is definitely required. Whatever you do to control it, you cannot leave an open pallet of open ground. It will come back. Um, when it's little, it's an excellent grazing crop. But once it starts to form its seed heads, the livestock and wildlife really don't like it. It causes problems with um, 
swollen jaws and gum lines. So if it gets to this point, they're less likely to eat it. They will eat it early. Ranchers love it because it's an early green up. They can turn their livestock out earlier with the cheat grass because it's up before any other grasses. But it also forms a duff layer so that no other grasses can actually set seed. So these are some bunch grasses, but the cheat grass, downy brome, has moved in and is pushing all the other grasses out. So we can treat it, we can hand pull it, we can pre-seed with an alternative, um, something to compete with it. Selective herbicides work well. Just keep in mind that nature abhors a vacuum. So if you control the cheat grass, either with fire or herbicide or whatever, you need to replant and compete for space and water. Otherwise the cheat grass and stuff will move right back in. There are some amazing new herbicides within the last 10 years that are great for rangeland control of cheatgrass, but using those herbicides, you have to replant with something to give it some competition. So this is that native that I mentioned in the first slide, um, foxtail barley. It's a very aggressive spreader. It is a bunch grass. It has these aggressive little seeds that will burrow into fur and gets into mowing equipment. They lodge into um, wheels and, and vehicles. It moves very rapidly with mowing equipment. Um, you can mow this and then it will grow and set seed below the mower level. So mowing is not a good option to control foxtail barley. Um, you can cultivate in the early spring or late fall. That'll help break up the rhizomes and, and kind of control it um, pre-bolt. And then herbicide is, and burning are probably your best bet. And then again, creating something to compete with it. Um, foxtail barley is native, but it's not palatable. And so most grazing animals, once it reaches this color, they really don't touch it. So it is a very aggressive competition for desirable forages, desirable bunch grasses, especially in rangelands and pastures. So we're seeing jointed goat grass a little bit more in some of our grain growing areas. Um, the grain producers do a really good job of keeping it out of their fields, but we're finding it along roadsides and in some areas that are not actively farmed CRP. Um, if one plant got away, it'll really get away quickly. One plant can produce over 3000 seeds. There can be a hundred stems per root bunch. And so it's very rapid bunch grass. It will cross with some of the wheat varieties. And so you can start getting some contaminated wheat. Uh, Jonid goat grass is definitely a concern to our grain growers. Um, it looks like winter wheat, but it has more of a reddish color. Um, there are hairs and the leaf edges and the junctions of the stem. So you'll see some real fine hairs. Um, and it has a very jointed appearance to the seed heads itself if it gets that far. Early spring tillage and repeat when you start seeing new growth. There are some soil bacteria that seem to help with it. The best controls include crop rotation and chemical fallowing and burning so you don't have that crop residue when you're trying to control jointed goat grass. Another large rangeland problem in eastern Washington is yellow star thistle. Yellow star thistle loves drought-like conditions. Um, it does very, very well in disturbed, poor soil areas. It has a fairly deep taproot, so it takes advantage of that early moisture. It germinates and will um, kind of winter over, so it can be an annual or a short-lived biennial. It has a very grayish appearance because of the fine fuzz on the stems. It looks um, kind of like a cotton ball on a stick when you have the old seed variety sitting around waiting for new, new time to grow. Um, timing and control of application of yellow star is huge. If you spray this after it has bolted, it will put all of its energy into seed production and flower. And then you still have viable seed, even though the plant may wilt and go away. Um, you can mow it, but again, it will start creating this real dense mat below the mower deck level, and it'll actually create a carpet of flowers right on the ground. So mowing is not a good option unless you have a follow-up for something else. Um, it is deadly to horses. Sheep, goats, and cattle can feed on it before it blooms. 
but it causes chewing disease in horses, which it has a chemical that they would become addicted to and they will search for yellow star. Um, it causes blisters around their tongue, lesions in the brain, and it literally prevents them the ability to swallow. So they will starve to death. There's no treatment, there's no cure. So once they've been exposed to it and they search it out, it's just an accumulative toxin that over time gets to the point that it's deadly. Um, cattle, sheep, and goats will feed on it before it starts to bloom, but after it starts to bloom, it gets this really hard spine around the base of the flower. It's the only part of yellow star that has a thistle on it. And so it's not real palatable and they don't like being poked by it. And so they won't really if graze through it once it's started to go to this stage. So this is some yellow star. It is allelopathic, so it changes the soil chemistry. It prevents other things from wanting to grow with it. It's a real common contaminant in some non-certified hay. Um, it's really difficult to pull yellow star seeds out of alfalfa seeds or grass seeds. Um, so once it's a contaminant, you really have to control it. Um, we do have some areas that are um, they're controlling yellow star because they planted contaminated seed. There are some really good biological controls that work on yellow star. So we have some areas similar to this rangeland where we've released biologicals that we can't get into to spray and they do a good job but it takes several years for biological controls to get numbers up get established to do a good job so if you're trying to do something where you're going to put livestock spraying and, and manual control is really your better options So this other one, Russian knapweed, has the same toxin as yellow star thistle does. It is deadly to horses in smaller amounts. Uh, Russian knapweed is a perennial. It has a rhizome root system. So all of these plants are probably connected underground. Disking, um, breaking up the soil and tillage is actually the worst thing you can do because it multiplies your prop and it just propagates it faster. Um, Russian knapweed can have up to 20 flowers per stalk, and so it's a very aggressive seeder as well. So it, it does reproduce by rhizome as well as by seed. Um, it has a white latex sap, and this the roots of Russian knapweed are a dark brown or a black papery covering, so they're kind of easy to determine. But um, we see a lot of Russian knapweed, like you can see in this, it's between an irrigation ditch and a crop area. The crop area is clean, the ditch bank is clean, and it's this bank between the two where you can't get to it to mow that makes it difficult. So selective herbicides work well on Russian knapweed. And we do have some biocontrols that we release on Russian knapweed in areas that you can't feasibly get to to control well with herbicide or equipment. So there's lots of knapweeds in Eastern Washington. Um, the top three of our concern are Russian, diffuse, and spotted. So the diffuse and spotted um, are biennial or winter annuals. They have been known to hybridize, so they will cross. Once in a while, you'll start seeing some dark spots on some diffuse plants. You'll see pink flowers on diffuse. You'll see white flowers on spotted. The spotted knapweed, the best control to identification is the little uh, black spots on the bracts of the flowers. Spotted knapweed is typically a little longer, taller. They grow from the base up, whereas diffuse will grow and then it'll branch out. So it's more of a ball shape. Um, we do not enforce control on either of these in Yakima County. We do have spotted designated in a few areas because it's very limited. We're using biocontrols a lot for um, diffuse and spotted knapweed control in areas that it has just taken off and it's gotten out into areas that we can't feasibly control. In fact, you can see a little biocontrol um, weevil on that knapweed there. Um, the seed germination is stimulated by fire. So fire is not a good control. And we're actually going into some of the areas where we have had wildfire and trying to control with fall rosette spray applications um, to, get a, to get a handle on the knapweed infestations in Yakima County. And this new lovely one, um, 
when I first started in 2003 was thought to only be in one location in Yakima County, but they didn't realize how fast it moves. So Hound's Tongue has these beautiful little burgundy flowers that can be anywhere from yellow and pink to blue and purple, depending on the soil. Most common, they are red to burgundy. It has a large taproot, but every place that there's a little flower, there will be four little nutlets and they're Velcro covered. And as you can see in this tennis shoe, they're little seeds that look like a tick. They are Velcro covered and they stick to anything that walks through it. Hound's tongue is deadly to anything that eats it. It's a liver toxin that accumulates over time. So it's definitely a concern with wildlife that graze as well as our livestock. If you find um, hound's tongue in hay or forage crops that are harvest, the Department of Ag has determined that like uh, tansy ragwort on the west side, hound's tongue is a toxic feed source. And so if a producer finds that they have this in their fields and it gets bailed into the forage crops and sold, the producer of that crop can be liable for damages caused by whatever animal, um, caused to whatever animal consumes that forage. So we're finding this in hay fields, especially where animals are taken off of rangeland and wintered over at home on the hay field. We're finding it where coyotes and deer and skunks run through properties and, and brush seeds off. And so it's one of those that we're finding in places that wildlife has access to throughout Eastern Washington. And um, it is especially where animals will bed down or rub up against brush or a fence or something like that. So earlier, um, I think Sky spoke a little bit about poison hemlock and I will as well. Water hemlock is the nation's most deadly plant. It's the mo most deadly plant in North America. However, it is native to North America. It is found more and more on irrigation ditches and in pastures and water settling ponds now than we have seen it in years. We have, um, <laughs> excuse me a minute, please. Uh, we have um, started finding this in areas where people think it's just a common wildflower. And so they just don't, they don't pay a lot of attention to it. I call it a generation gap plant where um, our grandparents knew that it was a toxic plant and it would affect the livestock. So they would keep it out of their farms. And then the generations move away from home they get away from farming. And now we have small postage stamp farms being purchased. And people think that it's just a common wild, water flower or wildflower and they don't pay any attention to it. So water hemlock um, has little pockets in its root system, as you can see in the center picture. And this is a really young plant. Um, I've actually dug up water hemlock that had two foot across root balls. They'll get huge. And so you'll see these real fibrous root systems with these pockets. And when you cut it open, there's a viscous yellowish colored fluid. And that fluid is the most concentrated toxin of the plant. The entire plant is toxic in all stages. So even when it's dry, it's also toxic. But what happens is if you have this plant growing along the water and animals are grazing along this and they step on it, the water can be toxic if the roots are crushed and they drain into the water. So the flow of the water will determine how toxic it is. So that'll determine the dose. If it's slow moving, stagnant, like a settling pond or a slow moving pool, the water will be more toxic for longer than if it's a fast flowing area that dilutes it very, very quickly. So animals can be adversely affected. People can be adversely affected. If you pull this plant out of the water with bare hands, you can absorb the toxin through your skin very quickly. Holding on to this plant for less than a minute or two, you will start getting headaches, dizziness, disorientation, nauseous, and those symptoms can last for several weeks, um, depending on how long you have it, how much you absorb it. So anytime you see this plant, anytime you might be handling this plant, make sure you're wearing a protective glove that's not going to allow you to absorb the toxins. Um, you can breathe the toxins of these plants. If it's hot and humid, they'll volatize and go into the air. So you start getting a headache or dizziness working around these plants. It could be because of the toxins if the weather's hot and it's humid. 
water hemlock has been mistaken for wild celery because it does grow kind of around itself. It's kind of ridged. It looks similar to celery and when it's, especially when it's a little bigger than this one. So it's something that if you're foraging, you want to make sure you're not um, expecting celery. Celery doesn't like this wet of areas. Water hemlock will go dormant. And we do have an area that was dry for almost 10 years. They put water back in the ditch and the hemlock came back just a full ditch full um, within a few months of getting water. So it's one of those plants that's very resilient. It's very drought hardy and tolerant. It'll go dormant and then it'll come back. All parts of this plant, the roots, plant fragments and flowers can reproduce. So you've get seeds dropping into the water, you get root fragments moving through the water, a piece of the plant gets broke off and moves downstream. They can all create new plants. So it's something to be very aware of. It's not just a pretty wild flower that looks like a dill or a wild carrot flower head. Um, and it, it's definitely something to be aware of if you're, if you're working in it or pulling weeds, not to handle it with bare hands. And then poison hemlock, as was mentioned earlier, um, is very common, the purplish reddish splotches on the stems. There's a little bit of a ridge to the stem, especially where the, where the leaf meets the stem. These purple splotches are not developed in the rosette stage. So when they're small, they don't have the purplish colored splotches that you see on the bigger plants. Um, they're no hair. So that's one of the things mentioned earlier. Wild carrot has a very fuzzy attachment and stem. Poison hemlock is very smooth at the attachment and stem. There is no odor of carrot. To me, poison hemlock does have an odor, but it is definitely not carrot. Um, these plants, um, this particular plant is about eight feet tall. These along the road were closer to 10. The concern with them growing along this area is if this area is mowed and pieces of this plant get thrown from the mower into this field that it is fenced where livestock are grazing, those dry fragments are more likely to be consumed by livestock than the growing plant. So that's when your accidental poisonings are going to happen. One bite of this plant will kill a cow in about a half an hour. And so having poison hemlock in the vicinity of pastures, in the vicinity of forage crops, or where you have people working um, is definitely a concern. You can absorb the toxins of poison hemlock through your skin. Um, sometimes it's just an irritation. I have seen people who have had really severe reactions to poison hemlock though. And so just being around it can make you sick, breathing it in, smelling the flowers, ingesting that pollen through your sinuses can cause very significant health issues. So be careful. This is also another one that is toxic when it's dry. And so even though you may treat this or mow it, um, the dry plant particles are toxic as well. So another common one that's also highly toxic, but not really to people is common groundsel. And of course, if you eat it, it's a liver toxin. It can cause liver failure. However, um, it's a problem we eat in cultivated crops, gardens, nurseries in Eastern Washington. It moves with irrigation water. These tiny little dandelion-like flowers will produce little teeny tiny seeds that are windborne as well as will travel. They'll kind of get lodged in clothing or, or fur of animals and move that way. If you stress this plant, it will go from bloom to seed production in less than 15 minutes. So it is a very rapid, um, mover of nutrients. And once it's stressed, it instantly pushes into seeds. So you have to remove the plant if you're in an area where there is grazing livestock, if it's got the potential to contaminate an adjacent field. Common grounds are the problem weed and can be controlled with tillage in the fall or early spring. Um, spraying works if it's young and tender and you can spray before anything else comes up. What we're finding is um, it moves with irrigation and it's very common in areas like orchards, vineyards, and um, some of the row crops that it doesn't affect. But the problem becomes when it moves to an adjacent field that could be a forage crop for livestock or, um, or a pasture where it could be a problem for grazing livestock that are there. 
um, about 25 years ago, a dairy in northeastern Washington lost 125 cows because common groundsel was in the hay they were feeding. So it's still toxic when it's dry. It's an accumulative toxin that builds up in the liver and causes liver failure. Um, there are several herbicides. It's very, very receptive to herbicide, but it has to be treated very early before the crop starts to grow. Otherwise, the treated plants are still a problem. One groundsel plant can produce up to a million seeds in one growing season. And so they're very, very prolific. Um, they are a winter annual. They do remain toxic when dry. They spread with wind and, wind and water. And so this picture here on the right is a forage green hay chop crop where they had chopped for um, a dairy silage forage. And I stopped them before they picked up that crop because the groundsel was about six feet from where the crops ended to the roadside was solid groundsel. So they ended up not harvesting um, about a 16 foot swath into that crop because of the risk of having groundsel out here in the middle um, was a little less. So they harvested this, they did walk the field a little bit first and decided that the edges of the crop would not be harvested. And then they did a spray program to um, prevent that from, from being a problem. So this one is a native. Dogbane is also known as Indian hemp. It's highly toxic even when it's dry. The sap can be a skin irritant. It is a sacred plant to the tribes of Eastern Washington. It's used in basket weaving. Um, it's used in a lot of their um, basketry and, and art. However, the sap when green can be a skin irritant. Um, it is highly toxic to grazing livestock and deer and wildlife. It has a very deep taproot that can have a creeping peripheral root system. So it creates these colonies. Um, mechanical control has very limited effect because of the creeping root system. Tilling will control the seedlings um, if it's done within the first few weeks of them starting to pop up before it bolts. Um, it is um, very difficult to control in soybeans. There's not an acceptable herbicide control to use on dogbane in a soybean crop. And so you have to apply before the plants are flowering and it, it can be very, very difficult to control. We really, um, we just recommend that people who have pastures and forage crops anywhere in the vicinity of creeping dogbane that they remove the dogbane because it is also toxic when it's dry. Brush skeleton weed is very widespread throughout parts of Eastern Washington. Yakima County has it in a few kind of containable locations. However, it is windborne and it is also a rhizome root system. And so it spreads throughout the roots as, as well as by seed. So pulling it will contain the seeds and the plant that you have, but that'll actually increase the number of plants that will return. A broad spectrum um, spray program for an area is best because if you just target this plant, you're going to miss little rosettes that are coming up in the vicinity. Um, tillage will spread it. Plants will grow from root fragments. Intensive grazing will limit seed production, but there's not a lot to this plant. Animals really don't care to graze on it. And so it's one of those plants that um, will continue to germinate throughout the year. Prevention is best if you see a small patch, hit it because you don't want it out into CRP or crop lands where it's just going to take off. Uh, winds uh, and highway traffic are big movers of seeds and fire will stimulate seed germination. So in, in this area, um, this actually burnt off several years ago. And when we went back in after the burn, we found just hundreds of little tiny seedlings. So it was a perfect time to treat was when all those little seedlings were up. But being aware that fire is a okay start to control, you need to follow up with something else after a fire um, creates a germination pattern. So this next one is um, Scotch thistle. Um, most Eastern Washington counties have it. This is one rosette. That shovel is about seven foot from tip to tip. So they get very large. It's probably the largest thistle in Eastern Washington. 
uh, this picture on the left, I was in a truck and we were completely surrounded by scotch thistle that was more than 10 feet tall. The seeds of scotch thistle are viable for up to 20 years. One flower can produce over a thousand seeds. The plants are really fuzzy, so you have to use a good surfactant if you're treating these plants to make sure you penetrate that fuzz, get into the plant, kill it before it bolts. Um, this is the perfect stage, um, this or smaller. This field would be a perfect stage. This is 300 acres of scotch thistle rosettes. Um, it's on some federal land that we don't have access to, and they make a, a good bedding, I suppose. They actually mow and bale this every year. Um, it's absorbing, the plant stops absorbing herbicide once it starts to bolt. So if you start seeing purple flowers, you have viable seed. And as soon as this plant gets stressed, all of its energy goes into those purple flowers. So spraying it when it's this size is really futile. Spraying it when it's small or cutting it, it has a taproot. So you can cut that taproot and that plant will die. It's not gonna come back from the root, um, but it will come back from seeds that are laying in the area where that one flower where the thousand seeds dropped. So it will form dense colonies very, very quickly if it's allowed to. Canada thistle, um, one of the first thistles listed on the Washington state weed laws. Yakima County um, advises control, but we don't mandate it except in some areas where we don't have very much. There are some biological controls um, that cause these little galls that prevent or limit seed and flower production. So they work kind of okay um, in areas we can't get to to physically spray um, the flowers create seeds that are windborne. There's lots of little uh, Canada thistle seeds out there. There are some cattlemen who believe it's good cattle feed. However, you can see that the cows have grazed everything but the thistle in this field. Um, this is one of the few thistles that has a rhizome root system. So it spreads underground. Less than 10% of the seeds of Canada thistle are viable. However, it'll form very dense colonies from underground spread, as well as the millions of seeds. 10% of a million is still a lot of plants. And so it's one of the perennial thistle plants that's difficult to control once you get it established. It's very susceptible to herbicide though. It's pretty easy to kill if you get it before it bolts. Russian thistle, and um, actually mentioned Russian and she meant Turkish earlier. This is Russian thistle, the common tumbleweed. It is a ball forming plant. So one root will create this big ball of branches. It starts out as a leafless structure. There's really no leaves on a Russian thistle. It has these slick green waxy stems that are difficult to penetrate. A good surfactant is mandatory. It is naturally herbicide resistant to most ALS type um, inhibiting herbicides. So glyphosate, Tordon, some of those are, um, it's just naturally resistant to it. So if you don't get it in this stage with dicamba or 2,4-D, some of the others that are more common broadleaf, um, it's really difficult to spray with herbicide to control. A lot of people don't realize that it has a really pretty flower but every one of these little flowers has a little pocket that creates two or three little seeds. And every little seed just sits there and waits until it blows. One large plant can produce 200,000 seeds. The tap roots are not very deep, but they'll break off and, and then the plant blows around and creates its own little um, offspring. It's, called, it's naturalized throughout the Western United States. This plant can cause kidney failure due to high levels of oxalates. Most animals tend to avoid it. It's very thorny. They don't wanna chew on it. But the biggest problem with tumbleweeds is they tumble and they create um, very dense patches. They're highly flammable. They burn very, very hot. And so they're very aggressive in their movement. They bury houses and cars and trees. So Russian thistle or the common tumbleweed um, is just a problem in Eastern Washington and most people try to kind of control it, but it's a challenge, but it's here. Velvet leaf is common, is a problem in a lot of corn growing areas. It is a common contaminant in field corn. 
it outcompetes other crops for shade and water, and it shades out other crops once it gets going. Um, unfortunately, usually shows up after the corn's three or four feet tall, and you're not out there in the cornfields. We've seen it on fence lines. I've seen it under bird feeders. Um, the seeds are viable for more than 50 years. One plant can produce between 700 and 17,000 seeds and they're allelopathic. So they change the soil. Nothing else likes to kind of grow around them. So they're not competing much and they'll form really dense areas. They'll outcompete everything else. Their tap roots are kind of easy to pull. They're not real deep tap roots. They do have a very woody stalk once they start getting bigger. Um, but they're easy to pull. And so if you can go through and, and mechanically pull these um, pre-harvest, you don't want to harvest and chop if you have a bunch of seeds and blooms. You're going to knock the seeds out of that little, uh, somebody called that a, a Reese's peanut butter cup looking plant um, about the size of a nickel. So about the size of a little peanut butter cup, but it's full of little teeny tiny black seeds. And those seeds are viable in the soil for 50 years. So once it's there, you just got to keep keep going. It's called velvet leaf because these leaves are really velvety soft. They're fuzzy. They're soft. Um, they'll kind of stick to you if you walk through it. This is a class A in Yakima County. We only have a couple locations of it, so we're hitting it really hard. Uh, Mediterranean sage is a tumbleweed as well. It will form these um, beautiful flower covered stalks that are anywhere from 12 inches to five or six feet tall. And then they dry and every flower has a dozen little tiny seeds smaller than poppy seeds and they dry up and they break off and they tumble around and they spread. And it's not palatable. It's very fragrant. It has kind of a foul rotten water odor. Some people say it's a sagey odor, but I don't, I, I like the smell of sage and I don't like the smell of this one. It's extremely fuzzy. Even the flower heads have a lot of almost cobweb looking fuzz. And so it's got this, this protection that prevents spray from being absorbed. So you have to use a good surfactant. It will outcompete beneficial forages very quickly because it's not got anything that, that likes to eat it. So it'll just move in and take over. Um, this is the toe of my boot, so it's a pretty good sized rosette. Starts looking like a cabbage plant as it gets a little bigger and a little leaves kind of curl up a little bit. It's really fuzzy like mullen, and some of the little plants look similar to mullen, but as it develops, they get these real toothed edges to their leaves, and it starts going more upright. Um, mullen has a stall a tall, thin spike of yellow flowers, whereas Mediterranean sage has more of a branched um, flowering appearance with little tiny white flowers. The stems, very square, very fuzzy. Um, this is a large plant, about four feet tall. The stems were about an inch across or a little less. They're very pithy, um, has a real dense white um, pith in the middle of it. So it's um, a very difficult plant to control. Once you start looking for it, it's pretty obvious that it's there. They are very susceptible to herbicides if you use a good surfactant. Um, they also have a tap root. So if you only have one or two plants, you can go in and cut that root, dig the plant up and control Mediterranean sage. And the last one I wanna talk about today is been in Washington state for a very long time but it has become a concern because it harbors this lovely little red and black bug called the spotted lanternfly. So Tree of Heaven was actually sold as an ornamental up to the early 60s. It's very fast growing, can get up to 70 or 80 feet tall. Um, 65 is, is kind of a national average, but we have some huge trees in Yakima County that have been there for 50, 60, 80 years, and they're taller than 65 feet. The problem with tree of heaven is if you cut one tree down, it puts all of its resources into suckering new trees. So from one tree, you get a grove of hundreds of little trees and it harbors this lovely little spotted lanternfly. It's the preferred food source for spotted lanternfly, which has been found in the Eastern United States. In the last eight years, it has migrated and taken over eight 
of the eastern seaboard states and they're having a really difficult time because it loves to feed on apples, hops, and grapes um, are the top favorite crops. Um, so it's a very big threat to Washington's economy. The tree of heaven has a large taproot as well as lateral roots that create suckers and thickets. The leaves and stems emit a rancid kind of foul, like old peanut butter odor when you crush them or if you rub them, if you break the limb, it smells like rotten peanut butter. So it's kind of easy to tell. It does have some lookalikes. It looks similar to a walnut or a sumac. Tree of Heaven gets much larger than a sumac, grows in more of an upright pattern. Uh, so this one here on the left is Tree of Heaven. The middle one is smooth sumac. And the one on the right is walnut. Walnut trees smell like walnut. And that's one of the biggest keys. However, they're also, the leaves of a walnut are slightly toothed. The sumac leaves are slightly toothed. Tree of Heaven leaves are very smooth, except for they have these little notches down here at the base of the leaf. And there's also a little gland underneath them. And then they have a little bit of a notch out towards the tip, but the rest of the leaf is smooth. And so that's a big tell factor for Tree of Heaven. Um, the V-shaped scars where the leaves attach. So this is one leaf with many leaflets where this leaf attaches to the main stalks. If they break off, you'll see this heart-shaped notch. Whereas if you break off a walnut leaf, it's more of, of a V or, or just a circle. There's not an obvious heart shape on it. Tree of Heaven branches are pithy. They have kind of a, a mushy center or a papery center. Um, they're easily broken. They're very brittle. So they don't do well with ice storms and heavy rains. You'll lose a lot of branches with Tree of Heaven. If you have Tree of Heaven and you are trying to get rid of it, you have to treat the cut stump within five minutes, 10 minutes of cutting it. Otherwise, the tree will heal over and it'll just put all of its energy into suckering. And so there's a lot going on right now with the Department of Ag and various counties around the state trying to control Tree of Heaven, getting corridors and right-of-ways and storage areas where it could harbor the spotted lanternfly coming into the state and becoming a rung in a ladder between where it comes into the state and where it moves to or migrates to the crops that support our economy. And if you have Tree of Heaven, you wanna to talk to a local weed board, if you have a tree company that you're controlling trees, talk to your local weed boards on what we need to do to treat those trees as they're removed, or you're going to create a bigger problem than just removing the tree itself. So with all weeds, agricultural and otherwise, rotate your herbicides, your modes of action to prevent resistance, integrated management, combining cultural and biological and chemical controls, um, no one tool is the absolute. Multiple tools in the toolbox give you better control for whatever weeds you're trying to control, whatever projects you're trying to accomplish. So always have multiple tools in your toolbox. Um, persistence and diligence are the keys to control for all weeds, noxious, toxic, and just obnoxious. So I thank you for your time. And... Um, are there any questions or comments? There is a question in the Q&A uh, about reporting even if you are treating Tree of Heaven and the answer is yes. Uh, I'll be talking about reporting in just a moment, but yeah, please, we still want reports um, even if you are treating it. They're super helpful and I will show you why. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and with that, All right. we'll stop sharing. Thank you. Let's see. And then, Sue, there was one more question about diffuse knotweed. If you want to type the answer um, to respond to that person. Which, okay, I'm not seeing this question. It'll then, just be in the Q&A. Okay. All right. Well, it is my turn. So hello, everyone. My name is Maria Marlin. I'm the Community Outreach and 
Environmental Education Specialist, the longest title ever, uh, for the Washington Invasive Species Council. And tonight I'm going to be giving a very broad overview of some things. So it's going to be like a great roller coaster of many different adventures. I'm going to talk about what the council does, some resources, weed prevention, reporting. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a fun time. It's not going to be as technical as the other presentations, though. So just wanted to warn you of that. Uh, those are, those are the experts. Uh, the council uh, deals with like reporting and prevention. So hopefully you will still learn a lot, though. And I will begin by talking about the council itself and what we are and what we do. So the Washington Invasive Species Council was created by the state legislature in 2006 to prevent and stop invasive species of, of really all types. Now to do this, what the council does is brings together all the state agencies that have a role in invasive species. And we also bring together tribal nations, federal, uh, local agencies, industry, universities, and conservation partners. Now, every organization represented on the council has a slightly different mission, but what the council does is unites everybody, looks at the big picture, and fills in the gaps that cannot individually be filled in. So to like picture this, we like to compare ourselves to a compass. So we provide policy level direction that all members can use related to invasive species response and management. And if you think about it, invasive mm -hmm. species don't respect, you know, administrative boundaries or borders, and they're really a global problem. So to successfully prevent new invasive species and just to stop the, the spread of species that are already here, each organization and each individual has this responsibility to work together to address the problem. Because on this like very fundamental level, we know how to prevent and stop invasive species, but each of us has a super important role to play. So from like the global scale all the way down to the neighborhood scale, there's really a role for everyone. So the council has three staff members. We are a super teeny team. Um, and we have Stephanie Helms, who's the executive coordinator. We have Jessica LaBelle, who's a program specialist. And then there's me. So we are guided by a strategic plan um, from 2020 to 2025, and then we get to create a new one. Uh, but in this plan, we have outlined key strategic areas, and there are six of them. And they are leadership and coordination, innovation and research, education and outreach, prevention, early detection and rapid response, and eradication control and containment. So tonight, we're going to look at examples of education and outreach, and then prevention as well. So our main goal in education and outreach is raising awareness. And awareness and our role in promoting awareness really comes in all shapes and sizes. So we have campaigns, we have events, we host workshops and symposiums. We work with partners not only across the state, uh, but across the whole region. We share information uh, like on social media, on our website, and we're also just a hub for free resources and educational material. So when we raise awareness, we really talk a lot about prevention and why it's so important. And this is the bioinvasion curve. And I love it. It's really, really great to visualize how an invasive species detection quickly becomes very costly. So I'm going to get my little laser pointer. So over here, early in time, if we detect an invasive species early enough, then we have a higher chance of eradication. However, as time goes on and the infested area grows and grows, that chance now becomes less and less likely. So in this area, we have to move to containment. So we've given up sadly on eradication and we're just trying to, convey, to contain the invasive species. And then if the infestation grows even more, 
we now have to pivot to resource protection and just trying to save valuable resources. And this is all the way up here on the curve when costs are extremely high. So prevention is really just the lowest cost solution here. And uh, one more thing to note here. So it's my goal and the goal of the council and all our amazing partners to increase the number uh, of birth detectors and just the number of trained individuals. So we can bring this point, this public awareness typically begins, I wanna bring it all the way down here to ideal early detection. So we can have more early detections earlier in time when we have that chance to eradicate. So in order to truly understand prevention, uh, we really have to understand how invasive species are spread. And there are many, many pathways, more than on the slide here, but these are just a few, uh, and some of them have already been talked about tonight. So I won't spend too much time on here, uh, but just to reiterate, uh, they all really have one unfortunate thing in common, and that's humans. So we can spread them either intentionally or unintentionally, and it really has been made worse by the global trade over the years. So in the upper left, we have boots, and there are many, many noxious weed species you've heard about in the various presentations that have seeds that are sticky uh, and will stick to footwear, your clothing, your gear. So that's one way that they can be spread. Uh, here in the middle, we have uh, some plants in a nursery. So what can happen is that a new plant can be introduced uh, and it's really pretty and life is good for a while. But then we realize, oh no, we, we are planting this nice plant and it likes our environment a little bit too much. And so it's quickly uh, growing quite a lot and outcompeting native species. Now we move to boats. Uh, you heard earlier uh, an example of a noxious weed being caught in boat motors and propellers. Um, so not only can it damage boats, but I mean, boats can also just unknowingly uh, be carrying these invasive species to new areas. Shipping containers, uh, you just heard about the spotted lanternfly. There's a number of other insects that will lay eggs on surfaces um, and it can travel um, to different continents, not just within the United States. Um, we can unfortunately be spreading invasive species intercontinentally. Uh, the pet trade. The pet trade is a way that invasive species can be introduced. And this happens when well-intentioned uh, pet owners maybe don't want their pet anymore. So they let it out into the wild to be free and live a happy life. Uh, unfortunately, one of two things will happen. The first thing that could happen is that it does not have a happy death. I mean, a happy life and it has a, a very sad death. Um, because it's just simply not adapted to the environment. But the exact opposite can happen. Just like the plants up here, it can like the environment a little bit too much and start reproducing really rapidly, outcompeting native species and changing the ecosystem. And finally, this picture right here is an example of intentional smuggling. Um, and so, yeah, so invasive species spread can, can be intentional. This person uh, is trying to sneak snakes through TSA security. So definitely don't advise that, but I mean, it's just, it's just reality. So unfortunately there are situations where invasive species spread is intentional. So we're gonna talk about some noxious weed prevention protocols. And again, just to reiterate that everyone is really important and has a role to play. Some things we like to recommend to prevent the spread of noxious weeds just in general is regularly inspecting and cleaning gear, especially before going to a new location, minimizing contact with vegetation and sediment. Not only you know, can you pick up seeds, but disturbing soil can actually make the habitat more suitable for some noxious weed germination and establishment. Now, if you're in an area where you know there's an invasive species, we ask that if you can, use dedicated gear specifically for that site or that water body. Also choose equipment that can be effectively decontaminated 
and then bring back up so in case you wander into a place uh, with an invasive species and now you uh, want to change your clothes before you move to a new location. So I said decontamination. What do we mean by decontamination? Decontamination is thankfully very simple. Uh, it has two steps. The first one is cleaning, so removing all visible debris, whether that's organisms themselves, sediment, mud, algae, plant material, anything you can see from equipment. And then really just rinsing it off before you leave the area. You can even make a decontamination kit that has really basic equipment, such as a stiff boot brush with a mud pick. Now, if you're an equestrian like myself, you will instantly realize that is a hoof pick. And yes, but it doubles as a mud pick for your own feet and your own boots. So that's thrilling. Uh, you can have rinse water, again, just to do that rinsing step of decontamination, a tote to carry it all, and a dog brush. So we often don't think about this, but our pets, especially those with like lots of fur, can very easily pick up those noxious weed seeds as well. And it's also really fun to make a boot buddy. Um, again, decontamination boots is so, so important for stopping noxious weed spread. And it's much more fun and much easier if you have a buddy do it, uh, unless you can like bend or you're a good contortionist, you know, you can just clean out each other's boots and it's more effective and more fun. Also, if you see a boot brush, you should use it. Please, please, please. Uh, boot brushes are growing in popularity in both the state and even beyond. And there's actually a recent initiative in the Columbia River Gorge to install boot brushes at high use recreation sites. Now, the previous coordinator of the Washington Invasive Species Council was so inspired by this that he actually sat down and wrote a grant proposal to do something super similar in the shrub step. And we got the funding and we're very excited about it. Uh, we have an awesome interagency advisory committee who's helping us develop an interest form to send to organizations in the shrub step. And we have 50 boot brushes to give out. So hopefully you're gonna be seeing a whole lot more of these in central and eastern Washington. And uh, it's just really quick and easy to move your boot back and forth in this brush. And the goal is to dislodge any seeds and debris that you could be unknowingly tracking into those new areas. And depending on where your boot brushes come from, you could even be treated to a nice sign with educational material up here for you to read while you clean your boots. So it's really a good deal. Now, don't forget aquatic noxious weeds and animals. There's two extra steps for boats. So our little mantra is clean, drain, dry. And for boats, uh, we ask that you remove all the water collected in the equipment from that site, from all parts of the boat, and then thoroughly dry it before you put it in another water body. And we say dry until aquatic vegetation is desiccated, or if you're in an area with known invasive aquatic animals, it has to be up to 30 days. All right, technical resources for assistance. Now we're gonna shift gears. Uh, well, Anne mentioned the Noxious Weed Control Board site. They have so many publications, but one I wanted to point out is this um, GardenWise. So there's a wonderful free online version of this, and this resource helps gardeners choose non-invasive alternatives for plant, for uh, landscapes and gardens, and even better, there are options that look very similar in color uh, to the noxious weeds that they replace. And this is just a screenshot of their website. Um, like she said, there's publications, and you can request physical copies. So they, their website is a great resource for assistance. And of course, I have to advertise the Washington Invasive Species website as well. Uh, we have our priority species, our noxious weeds, insects, animals, wildlife diseases. And if you click on each one, you're gonna be brought to a page that has 
all about the plant, all about identification, lookalike, the status in Washington. And in addition to all of our priority species, there's links to events, uh, how to report, news releases. So if you haven't already, I would encourage each of you to spend a few minutes on our website because there's really, there's something for everyone. All right, now we are going to talk about reporting. Now, reporting is one of my favorite things to talk about because it's the answer to the question, what can I do? And reporting helps us collect information on what plants are where, if they're spreading throughout the state, and what, if any, action may be required for follow-up. But first, let's look at this great example of why you should report. Aware and cross-trained individuals, they're really just the backbone of finding and reporting invasive species in Washington. You know, there's three of us, right? And I wish we could be everywhere all the time, but we can't, so we need your help. And this example focuses on insects. So since 1990, uh, there have been 70 introduced insects found in Washington. Now, what researchers did was reviewed each detection and categorized how the species was detected. And then they classified each type of reporting party who made the detection. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through this graph. So let's start over here. 28% were detected through targeted trapping by entomologists. And 20% were detected as bycatch through trapping for target pests. So if you add those together, it's 48% being made by professional entomologists. Okay, so contrast that against 36% found by private citizens. And I got 36 by adding 23 and 13. These were made by the public to either Washington State University or the Washington State Department of Agriculture. And then up here, we have 16% being found by non-regulatory biologists or non-entomologists, such as fish surveyors who simply snapped a photo of an insect that they didn't recognize. So if we add 16, 13, and 23 together, that's 52% that were found by first detectors, whether they were just members of the public or cross-trained professionals. So hopefully this graph makes you feel very inspired and it's really, it's a call to action to mobilize your friends, your community, your family to help us detect and report invasive species. And here is how you do the reporting. There are a few different options. So if it's uh, during normal business hours, there is an emergency aquatic invasive species hotline. Do you see like an invasive mussel or something in the water? We definitely wanna know ASAP. Uh, there's also a feral swine hotline. If you are in the state of Washington, Oregon or Idaho, you can call this hotline to uh, well report a feral swine. Exciting. And just a little fun fact here, in the state of Washington, any feral swine outside of, well, any feral pig, or just any pig in general, outside of captivity is considered feral. So if you have like a neighbor that has a little potbelly pig pet and it gets out, uh, it's actually considered feral and has to be reported immediately. We also have a mobile app, which I'm gonna walk you through in a moment. And finally, we have the website where you can find reporting forms based on the category of invasive species you want to report. So the WA Invasive Species mobile app is free and we all love free things, right? So that's one, one reason you should get it. It's easy to use, it's EdMaps powered and EdMaps, is similar to iNaturalist. I'm going to guess that most people on here know what iNaturalist is. Um, EdMaps is very, very similar. It is only for invasive species, though, but there's data, there's maps showing distribution and spread. Anyone can access it, and your report is going to go directly to EdMaps and improve that national map. And our app does contain the noxious weeds. Well, when you want to make a report on the mobile app, uh, there's a few steps that you should follow. 
And firstly, our app doubles as a digital field guide. And so that's very exciting. And you can just scroll through and find the noxious weed or invasive species that you want to report. And then the upper right hand corner, you just hit report sighting. It will bring you to a map and there's gonna be a pin dropped on the map. And that's gonna be exactly where you are at the moment. And if you saw the invasive species somewhere else, you're going to have to tap and drag that pin to where you saw the invasive species. We ask for a photo um, and with the app and on our website, you actually cannot proceed without a photo. We really, really need a clear photo for identification purposes. Next, you're gonna be brought to a screen where you write your name, your email address, and any comments. And in the comments box, we're not necessarily talking or looking for like a physical description of the species. What we're more looking for is locality. So if we were to go out and remove that invasive species, where exactly would we find it? For example, if I was hiking the Granite Mountain Lookout Trail and I found invasive species half a mile in on the left-hand side, that's something that I would write in the comments box. Next, you're gonna review everything, confirm that it's correct, and then hit save. Now this is, uh, this is a little tricky thing. So once you hit save, your report actually is not submitted. You have to go to the menu here in this upper left-hand corner and find your report queue. Now in your report queue, you're gonna find all the reports that have not been submitted yet. What you do is you tap it and then here hit upload. And then you're going to get a confirmation that your upload was finished. So that's a really important uh, part to remember is just to make sure you upload everything from your report queue. What happens after you submit a report really depends on a few things. Well, firstly, we have an immediate notification that goes out to council staff, state, tribal, federal agencies, local agencies, really anyone who has signed up to receive an alert will get an immediate notification as soon as you submit the report. The response is gonna depend on the lead agency, the species, and the area that the species was reported. And a good example of this is Scotch broom. Um, it's really widely distributed in Western Washington. So someone reporting Scotch broom in Western Washington, very, very important still, but the response is gonna be different. So they might get a fact sheet like on management and how to control it. Um, but if it's reported in Eastern Washington where it's not established, what will happen most likely uh, is that it will be, the response will be different. Someone actually might go out and treat it and remove it. And speaking of Scotch broom, I have a couple of quick case studies, again, highlighting why you matter, why reports matter. And the first one is talking about the great Scotch broom regional census. Scotch broom, uh, if, you, if you're on the West side, you're probably very familiar with it. Uh, it's very costly. It's a noxious weed uh, in the Pacific Northwest and it has an impact of uh, roughly 143 million per year. However, up until this initiative, which took place in 2020, the exact distribution of this noxious weed in the state was really poorly understood. It has just been here for so long that there really hadn't been any clear distribution data. Everyone was just like, oh yeah, it's everywhere, but we weren't quite sure really where. And it's hard to request management funds without like actual data. So this is kind of showing why it's important to report even low priority species. And so what we did was mobilize citizen scientists to go out and report Scotch broom sighting. And here are the results. iNaturalist had 320 census reports and our WA Invasives app had 782. And this was just really helpful for a few reasons. Having this data allowed counties to justify increasing budgets for noxious weed control, it helped local partners develop budget requests, it prompted new volunteer management initiatives, and each person who made a report received information 
on how to manage Scotch brew. So we even snuck in some education and outreach. The second one deals with Tree of Heaven. And I'm very happy that Sue just talked about it. So I won't have to go too much into Tree of Heaven. Well, prior to mm, 2000, uh, 2020, 2021, this was, the, this was the distribution that we had or the distribution map of Tree of Heaven in Washington. Any of the counties in green mean that, yeah, we have some data for them. Anything in white, was no known infestations. Anything with the slash marks through it means it's present, but we don't actually know like the extent. Uh, oh, sadly, no eradicated. Uh, and then gray, yes, we do have one county where there was just simply no data. And overlaying this with this somewhat disturbing map showing that there's a lot of suitable habitat for the spotted lantern fly in Washington prompted us to do something about this. And so once again, we mobilized citizen scientists and we're like, look, we really need your help. Please go out and find Tree of Heaven and report it. And it was great, it worked really well. Uh, we had 400 reports submitted in total. And remember that map? Okay, all those white, all the white counties? Well, we found that eight counties should not be white. Uh, it was detected in eight new counties. We also had a webinar with uh, information on the spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. It was attended by over 100 people and we had a lot of visits to our website and our social media reach also skyrocketed during this time. Well, some key takeaways, if you remember anything from my presentation, it should be please report invasive species sighting. Everyone has a role to play. Uh, we covered awareness, reporting, and simple actions to take in preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species. And I guess I can just urge you to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. All right, so it is now time for our code word. Um, this is for WSDA credits, pesticide recertification credits. Please in the chat write your name your license number, and the code word. We need the code word or else you cannot receive credit. And if you only give us the code word and you don't give us your name and license number, then you can't get credit. You need all three, name, license number, code word. In one line, not in separate lines. All right, I'm gonna look at the Q&A while that's going on. Is NMAPS connect connected with iNaturalist? Unfortunately, there are they are two separate things. They are not connected. Has emerald ash borer been found in Washington yet? Thankfully, no. We are really, really trying to keep it that way. Um, it has not been detected in Washington. The closest is still that Oregon detection. But isn't it like Northern Oregon kind of near Portland? Uh, yes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it's Forest Grove. Yeah, definitely worried, but there has been no detection so far. Good. Yeah. I mean, huge shout out, truly. We've had presentations from the Oregon Department of Forestry. Uh, they're doing a phenomenal job. So hopefully, hopefully it stays there. For book cleaning, we've been advised to use formula for 09 after stream sampling. Does this work better than water? Uh, I'm honestly not sure. Um, I used to do no. stream monitoring for insects, and we would have to use um, bleach and vercon um, in addition to water. Like, we would just, like, put the bleach and the vercon in the water um, and then scrub in there. Um, so I believe it will work better. And that we had to do that because of the uh, fungus that attacks um, uh, amphibians and also potentially for the New Zealand mud snails. Oh, okay. Okay. Was there anything in the chat that I missed? Looks like no. I don't think so. Okay, cool. Uh, is the code word case sensitive? No.
So if anybody has questions, put them in the Q and A so they don't get lost in the code word um, <laughs> uh, waterfall, and uh, we'll answer them as people put in their uh, license number information. Um, is how is climate change affecting how invasive species are managed? Uh, so. A lot of species are changing range with climate change. So that's the biggest thing that comes to mind for me with that, where like it could be in the future that like um, Palmer amaranth, it's native to the Southwest US. It, its range could move here and then it's a native plant, but it's so bad for agriculture that I imagine you would still treat it like a noxious weed. Um, how will we know if the credit has been entered into WSDA? Um, I'll put through the paperwork probably in the next uh, few days. And then if you check the website, they have a way to like check your credit um, based on the license number. But it'll probably take them a little while to update it just because they have a lot of presentations and trainings happening right now. So that'll probably take a little while for it all to go through on their end. Oh, I see a comment. Thank you, Jeff. I did not know that. And I'm very sorry. iNaturalist reports do get populated into EdMaps. Well, now we know. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Should sightings of noxious weeds within city limits be reported? Yes. Definitely. Um, you can also reach out to the local county weed board with sightings um, if you are like really worried about it uh, and they can take a peek and maybe if they have resources deal with it or tell the local municipality to deal with it. We use a mapping program uh, that the board then issues uh, not as obnoxious weeds or right away notifications. Yeah, so some places have stuff that kind of automatically goes through stuff. Oh, there's um, well, the website. The okay, great, yeah. There's a website to check your WSDA credits. Thank you, John. I'm just, just going to add to the also to if you see weeds in the city, I know that for the King County weed program, which we have one of the bigger programs, we still only have resources really to address regulated weeds. So any non-regulated weeds such as, you know, English ivy, blackberry, things of that sort will likely, unless it's on your property and you just kind of want some guidance on approaching it, we'll probably just have to say, because it's not a regulated weed, we don't have the resources or jurisdiction. So here's some website research resources. So regulated weeds can usually help though. For Ken Johnson, that's um, asking about the mapping program. The program you're using for your weed board probably does not report to the Department of Ag or WISC if it's not I form or one of the WISC apps that she was talking about. And Tree of Heaven is not regulated in King County. 